Good evening and welcome. This is a special meeting of the Princeton Planning Board on October 13th, 2022. Pursuant to Section 13 of the Open Public Meetings Act, adequate notice of the time in this special meeting has been given by filing a copy with the Clerk of Princeton on the 23rd day of December, 2022. Notice of this meeting has been posted to the municipal website, princetonnj.gov calendar. Pursuant to Executive Order 107, due to the state of emergency in New Jersey regarding COVID-19, notice that during the declared state of emergency, all regular and special meetings of the Princeton Planning Board will be held electronically via Zoom, was transmitted to Princeton Packet and The Times, and was filed with the Clerk of Princeton on April 8th, 2020, and again on January 6th, 2021. Please note that this meeting is being recorded. Those wishing to comment orally should virtually raise, oh, excuse me, I skipped a paragraph. During hearings on applications for development, members of the public will have an opportunity to comment and ask questions. Public comment is heard by the board after the applicant's representatives have finished their presentations and have been questioned by the planning board members and staff. Those wishing to comment orally should virtually raise your hand using the button at the center of the bottom of your participant screen or if participating by phone by pressing star nine. Oral comments will be taken in the order in which hands were raised. We ask with respect that members of the public express your views in three minutes or less. We'll have a countdown clock to help speakers keep track of time. Please note that speakers who exceed three minutes will be interrupted. Inappropriate public comment containing obscenity, hate speech, or relating to matters not before the board will be muted. Carrie, would you call the roll, please? Ms. Kathy Zoli? Here. Mr. Chow? Here. Mr. Cohen? Here. Mr. McGowan? Here. Mr. O'Donnell? Here. Mr. Quinn? Here. Ms. Sachs? Mr. Texarni? Mr. Taylor? Here. Mr. Bodeheimer, Mrs. Wilson. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Um, announcements, any members of the board or um, staff have announcements? Okay, um, subcommittee reports and updates. Um, as most folks heard, I'm suggesting that we defer these to next week um, for our regular meeting um, in the interest of time, partly because one of our key professionals needs to leave, but also that it's probably good practice to have those updates at regular meetings as opposed to at special meetings. So with no objection, I'll go on to the resolution and findings of fact, um, Judson and Cynthia Oaks Linville, this is a minor subdivision at 1075 and 1087, the Great Road, block 2001, lots 18 and 19, file number P2121-167MS. Um, folks probably remember this. Jerry, do you have any comments on this or are there any questions about the resolution? Uh, Mr. Cohen. I just, I didn't have time to get all the way through it. And I wanted to make sure the condition we had talked about for removing the front parking lot that was within the front yard setback did make it into the resolution. Yeah, it has. Um, it, that would be, um, let me see. Um, It is here. So it's uh, condition H on page 16. Okay, great. I, like I say, that was my only concern. I, yeah, I'm glad you raised that. Thank you. Um, so there are no other questions about this. Would someone like to move this resolution? I'll move, move it. Resolution. Moved by Mr. Taylor, seconded by Mr. Cohen. All in our guess uh, with a resolution, we should do a roll call vote. Uh, I don't think alternates are able to make the motions. Oh, so. sorry, Jack. 
Sorry. Um, as a, but I appreciate, I very much appreciate the thought. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, to, sorry to be so <laughs> aggressive. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. If they're so eligible, I'll, I'll assume it was moved by Mr. If they're, Cohen. If they're, second to, if, they're, if they're eligible to vote on the um, on the resolution, they can make the motion. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Well, Carrie is, is Carrie, that you're, you're Mr. at the Cohen. top of my list of favorite people. Oh. <laughs> Thank goodness. Thank you. So, Thank you. Uh, roll call. So vote. Carrie, Mr. Taylor is eligible to vote on this. Yes. Letter? Yes. Okay. Good. Okay. Ms. Capizzoli? Yes. Mr. Chow? Yes. Mr. Cohen? Yes. Mr. McGowan? Yes. Mr. Mr. Quinn? Yes. Mr. Taylor? Yes. Mrs. Wilson. Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Um, next up, we have a concept plan presented by the trustees of Princeton University. This is Schmidt Hall, a Washington Road and Geo Lane, block 45.01, lot 101. This is file number P2222-235C. Um, uh, I see Mr. McCoy. I don't yet see... Oh, there you are. Hello, Mr. Duke. <laughs> I was hiding. <laughs> um, so, uh, Mr. Dobromilski, um, before we um, invite the, yes, you need to be sworn in. And we'll, I know that you need to leave uh, fairly shortly. So let's hear from you first and any other comments from professionals, but I think you're the, yes, you're the man. Since this is a concept plan, um, we're not, we don't not swear people in. Okay. Oh, it's not, okay. It's not a formal. Hearing. I appreciate. I appreciate you. Good evening, everyone, um, and I appreciate you accommodating me this evening. Uh, so I'm going to lead this off with uh, from my August 22nd, 2022 report on planning and landscape architectural analysis. So I'm going to share a screen here. Hopefully that's working. Can you see that screen? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, so well, the 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 kind of lead you. In, this is a sheet A six five eight from the plan submission that was submitted, and it's on, it's the online taken from online, um, and so we'll start with the image to the south or the bottom of the page, looking south. Uh, on this image, Washington Road is on the left side. Um, I believe it's Giat Hall. Is that how you say that? Um, Gio. Gio Gio Hall is right in front of front of you there. Um, and um, so this the, this block, if you can see my cursor, is the, the application is about. Uh, so looking at it from the other side here, so Geo Hall's up here now. Uh, this is the block we're talking about, uh, Washington Road over on this side. What the applicant is in all these buildings are what's included. Uh, the application requests conceptual site plan review for the pro proposed construction and reconstruction of buildings to create a new home for the computer science department, as well as the Center for Statistics and Machine Learning and the Center for Information Technology Policy. The proposal will include renovation of some of the buildings, Gio and Moffitt and Schultz Labs, these buildings here, I'm tracing with my cursor, and removal of these buildings here in internal kind of. Um, so there'll be 98,000 square feet of renovation and 130,000 square feet, give or take, of new construction. Um, the new construction will create a rectangular structure connecting the existing Geo Hall and um, back down to Malfit Lab. So I'm going to go through the drawings back up to sheet um, L100 now, so you can see how, what that looks like. So I apologize for spinning through these quickly, but let's get to that one. So this is now looking at the plan view, Washington Road on your right, uh, Geo at the top, Moffat Lab, Schultz Lab, and this is the part that will be reconstructed to make the connection here. So the building in the middle is going to be removed and the building that was in this area here will be removed. This is sheet L100. 
Uh, the existing tower facade of Geo Hall to the north will not be altered, but interior accessibility modifications will occur. The west side of the building will front on di the diagonal walk, um, and which will be reconstructed in this location to create better access, in particular fire access. The primary entrance to the new building will occur down at the bottom of the screen here to the, I guess that's to the south in this location here off of Goheen Walk. The east side of the building is, is, is bounded by Washington Road and the landscape in this area will not change. So the view from Washington will not change. Um, the project will include four new or four vehicular parking stalls. A drive for the loading will be removed. Refuse services will be rerouted to the Thompson Labs via a tunnel. Pedestrian bicycle and landscape elements will be significantly enhanced with new connections, bicycle parking, and new outdoor spaces with plantings, um, implementing materials in keeping with other recent university projects. So there's a new courtyard here and new landscape all along this side uh, here uh, on the left. The new building measures approximately 80 feet by 96 feet in height above existing grade and 210 feet in horizontal length. And the difference in grade is because of the, the site slopes. The building um, suggested that the building bulk seems to be consistent with other nearby buildings, but they really should provide uh, some tables and some information on that. And I believe the applicant is, has been prepared to provide some more information on building height uh, relative to the code standards. Uh, a new stormwater drainage system will also be developed in accordance with municipal regulations and university goals. There are no environmental constraints, nor historic, scenic, or archaeological landmarks, landmark sites or designations. The landscape architectural design presents an informal kind of organic design consistent with other recent campus projects for two thirds of the exterior spaces to help integrate the new and existing structures. As you can see here, the new landscape wraps around this portion of the landscape to the bottom right left the right will stay as it is. Uh, the landscape along Washington Road will remain unchanged. Citing the new construction predominantly within the footprint of existing structures to be removed would appear to result in a minimal amount of existing tree removal to implement this project. The proposed new courtyard landscape spaces will also replace structures and hardscape with functional outdoor spaces offering social and environmental enhancements. So it seems like there's a lot of positive aspects to this project. Um, and I think that's pretty much the summary as I could see it, if there's any questions. Any questions for Dander Bromilski by the board? Okay, Mr. DeGrazia, welcome thank back. And uh, thank you and your, uh, and Mr. McCoy and your team for um, accommodate, well, you, yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry you yep. sat through the whole no. other meeting where we didn't hear you, I guess yes. is what I'm trying to say, and um, look forward to hearing what you have to say tonight. Thank you, Madam Chair. You stole my line. I was first going to thank the board and the staff for setting up the special meeting and um, attending this evening. We, we really do appreciate your, your time, you know. Um, so, as uh, Dan Dobromilski uh, reviewed, uh, tonight we're here to share with you a concept plan. When the university has a major project, uh, we like to come before the planning board and share with the municipality and the community our plan before a formal submission is, is made. It gives us an opportunity to talk about it um, and hear some feedback, which um, we find very helpful. And that's why we're here this evening. Um, as um, Dan indicated, we're here to talk about Schmidt Hall and it involves both the renovation and the expansion of Geo Hall. Um, I won't get into many of the details because the university has put together a very comprehensive uh, uh, presentation. So unless there is a question, I'd like to introduce Princeton University architect, Ronald McCoy, who will lead us through that uh, PowerPoint presentation. Great, go right ahead, Mr. McCoy. 
Great. Good evening. Thank you, Madam Chair. And just to show you how much we appreciate being together with you, we have planned a four hour presentation here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have the VR goggles that we requested, <laughs> Mr. McCoy? So I'm going to get started. Here we go. You can see this, I trust? Yes. Okay. I think uh, Mr. Dobromilski did a very good job uh, framing the conversation. I'll fill in a, a, a few bits of it and explain a little bit more detail as we as we go along. So this is the Eric and Wendy Schmidt Hall, uh, and it does involve the, the transformation of the existing GEO building. This is a, a range of topics I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our, our value proposition, our site strategy, our um, initiatives related to sustainability, and along the way, we'll give an a over, overview of the project. You may be familiar with this value proposition. I think we've presented it with the beginning of each one of the projects that we have presented for land use approval. It's basically a promise to ourselves of what we plan to deliver, what we will deliver uh, with this project. Um, this will become a, a, a center for computational thinking on the Princeton campus. And it's a fantastic location because it's right across from uh, the first campus center. And it is uh, the most popular uh, department on campus for our undergraduate students. And so it gives them a key, a key location in the heart of campus. It also serves as a bit of a, a headhouse for the engineering school, which um, as you know, will uh, evolve on Ivy Lane and Western Way to the east. And you see here, it'll be a home for the computer science department, center for statistics and machine learning, the Center for Information and Technology Policy, and the Princeton Institute uh, for Computational Science and Engineering. Uh, some of the key words here are highlighted. That is a, it is an, uh, intended to be a vibrant and interdisciplinary hub. Uh, it is a, uh, a, the central location allows it to be an intellectual and physical resource for every division on campus. It's designed to create uh, um, serendipitous uh, encounters and opportunities for conversation. It's also designed to be welcoming and accessible, uh, functional and attractive, and uh, distinctive to the mission and identity of the School of Engineering and Computer Science at Princeton. This is another reminder of the campus plan. Um, we've shared this again as we've presented all of our projects. Uh, and this is the diagram that shows the east-west connector. Uh, and that is a, a sort of campus planning device that we have used to unify a set of projects that we've shared with you uh, through the middle of the campus. On the far left, you see the Dillon Gymnasium Edition. Toward the middle is the new home for University Health Services. In between is Hobson College, which we will be sharing with you someday soon. Schmidt Hall is identified, or Geo Hall was identified then before the donors of Eric and Wendy Schmidt, and then the new neighborhood to the east for environmental studies and, and seas. At the time of the campus plan, we had not designated this for computer sciences and the, and the kind of computational uh, thinking hub. But as we began uh, a lot of uh, sort of detailed planning around programmatic opportunities, we realized that this would be a fantastic location for these programs on campus. Uh, this is a plan diagram <clears throat> of that east-west connector showing how it intersects with all these important north-south connectors through campus, including Washington Road here uh, on the east side of the project. The project site is highlighted in pink and um, all these buildings in the lighter uh, pink color are, are new buildings that are part of the current uh, capital plan and underway, the Art Museum, Dillon, uh, Hobson College, Health Services, environmental studies and seas. So uh, Schmidt Hall will play a, a really central role in all of that. And this is the first campus center that I referred to. This is the existing building. It's a fantastic um, collegiate Gothic building. It's a, a bit crusty and ornate, but we love it. And uh, this is an opportunity for us to uh, renovate the building, make it a, um, a exemplar in uh, energy performance and sustainability and take advantage of uh, the loft-like interiors, uh, relatively narrow floor plates. It's a little bit less than 65 feet across, uh, has enormous windows to the north and south, brings in tremendous uh, natural light, which is perfectly uh, well suited for the, the dry laboratory space that will be in this building. This is not a wet laboratory building. It's a 1909 building. 
that over the decades has become a home for environmental studies and uh, geosciences. And so it has been over time adapted as, it, as best it can be for those laboratory functions. So when we build the new neighborhood for environmental studies to the east on Ivy Lane, we can uh, empty this building and then restore it really to the, the loft-like interior that it uh, has at its, at its uh, core. These are some additional views of the, of the building. Um, a very beautiful facade to the north. Those two tower entrances will be slightly modified to become accessible. You see one in the lower left. And in the right, lower right, you see a view of the common space, which was the museum space of the, build, of, of the original building in 1909. Uh, to, we're looking to the east and to the left of us, it's a two-story high space uh, with, with windows out to the, uh, to the north to Frisk Campus Center. Over time, this is a space that has been infilled with offices and the, the daylight has been more or less lost uh, to this central space. One of the key um, opportunities of this project is to recapture the space and, and remake it in its original form to serve as a commons for uh, the uh, Schmidt Hall. Uh, these are some, some details uh, of the building. As I said, it's uh, ornate, uh, richly carved with uh, uh, gr grotesques and gargoyles. And uh, I did a little research. I'm going to deviate just for a second and tell you the interesting stories. Uh, these, these sculptural uh, grotesques and gargoyles are attributed to Gutzen Borglum, who was the sculptor responsible for Mount Rushmore. Mm. There are more than 65 of them on the building. And the uh, biological wing was the uh, east wing originally, and the grotesques there were living species. The geology wing was the west wing, and those are extinct species. So you'll get a pterodactyl uh, to the west, and you'll get an eagle or an osseous on the, on the east. This is a plan and some of the- very cool, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, a plan and some of the uh, aerial views uh, that Mr. Jobinowski showed. We are uh, proposing to demolish those central laboratory wings that uh, took place in the 60s and 70s and 80s. And that gives us an opportunity to, to, to do two things. It gives us an opportunity to recapture the elegant facade, both um, as it expresses itself in the courtyard, which will be to the south, and also the interior experience as you move from the existing GEO into the new Schmidt addition, you'll pass through the res restoration of that uh, existing facade. Um, and it also then gives us a courtyard space, which will be a fantastic uh, community space with landscape and some stormwater management potentials in the center of the site. So really converting it from a sort of service-oriented laboratory internal space to something that um, ties together um, uh, the computational uh, thinking uh, in, in Geo Hall and Schmidt. Uh, some additional views, uh, again, uh, reiterating that the exterior will be kept intact. We will uh, renovate the exterior windows, make them uh, high performance glazing and improve the thermal performance of the facade. And on the south side, as I said, we can, we'll be able to reclaim uh, the beauty of, of that facade. If we look at the site plan, as I said at the beginning, this is part of that east-west connector, that strategy that connects the campus through the middle belt um, from east to west. Uh, to, the, to the left here, uh, we're showing uh, how that east-west connector will come through Hobson College, just at the at the uh, far left of the screen, right through here. It'll take a little bit of a dip down to accommodate grades, but also to preserve the cherry alley of Beatrix Ferrand, so it becomes an accessible route. This is set, there's a set of stairs here for for another connection, but the accessible route will dip down, will bring people to the new health services building, and then back up to an entry plaza at uh, at Schmidt Hall, and then continue. Uh, across Washington Road to the east and down Ivy Lane connecting to the new neighborhood for environmental studies and seas. You get a sense of the courtyard here. This is on two levels. This lower courtyard is on the level of Goheen Walk. There is a, another courtyard, which is one level above that, which is at the level of the um, uh, commons that we're going to reclaim at the center of the existing Geo Hall. And Mr. Dobomilski referred to the diagonal walk. That's this uh, loose diagonal that comes through campus. It comes uh, through here 
and we want to continue it all the way down past Goheen to Poe Field. Most importantly, it'll make this whole part of the campus fully accessible, which is fantastic because this is a location for our health services building. And obviously we want full accessibility to all buildings, but uh, probably none more importantly than the health services building. I will point out that there are some modest um, landscape um, uh, design on the east side of the building, again, to promote accessibility. For example, there's an entrance here at the east, one level below the main entrance that will be, that'll have an accessible connection to uh, a new pathway or a, a new design of the existing pathway along Washington Road that'll be fully uh, fully connected to this to this entrance here. This is a, a pretty much um, a diagram that shows some of the same circulation patterns and calls out some of the different landscape opportunities. So a variety of landscapes that sit into this uh, natural uh, topography, the plaza on the north, the landscape on the east, the terraced courtyards in the center of the building, and then the uh, court, the landscape of the diagonal walk, which will, which will sort of unify health services on the left and Schmidt Hall on the right. Uh, we, we see that these two tower entrances are going to be probably the primary entrances because most of the population is to the, to the north, east, and west, particularly this connection down to east campus to environmental studies and school of engineering. But nevertheless, Goheen Walk is going to be also a very, very busy entrance. And so as Mr. Dobomilski said, we will have a new entrance at that uh, southwest corner of the building. It's a big building, and one of the challenges is to make it um, coherent and easy to navigate uh, so that so that though you'll see as I begin to talk about um, some of the planning strategies, we have very direct connection from this new entrance at the southwest up to this historic commons in the center of Old Geo. The building is a little bit unusual for the Princeton campus in that it, it is an, a sort of urban block. Um, we've, we typically have our building sitting in a park-like setting or part of a collegiate Gothic courtyard fabric. This one does create a, a kind of centralized courtyard. Um, Schultz Hall is on Goheen. Moffat Hall is on Washington Road. Uh, and these buildings actually will not be touched by this project. So they're, they're not included in this project. They will remain as they are. But what's colored here, highlighted is Geo Hall, the new terrace off of the common space, as I said, a couple levels above the lower terrace, and then the new addition of, of uh, the new wing of Schmidt Hall. Um, the new addition will have a, a hybrid mass timber and steel frame structure really, uh, I'd say predominantly mass timber and uh, high performance envelope and glazing. To fill out the picture of the sustainability strategies, I will not go too deep in, ter in terms of this. I'd say that the, the highlights are that the building will be connected to our new um, heating and hot water system, which is fed by the geo exchange system that we're designing and building on, the, on this side of Washington Road and also on the east side of Washington Road. We will have intensive use of, of landscape uh, and uh, stormwater opportunities. It will have um, these, uh, these greening of the courtyards in the middle, the mass timber, the high performance envelope, and the uh, renovation of the existing building to dramatically improve its, its energy performance. Those operable windows, uh, things like that. Um, this is just a diagram of some of the stormwater management strategies. Uh, I'm going to just walk through the, these slides. We do have, I think, some consultants available who we can, uh, if, if there's some questions for them. But these are all things that we will we will be developing as we uh, move forward in the, in the design. And we're very mindful, uh, as we've learned through presentations with the former organization of SPRAB and Planning Board, that we will demonstrate how this building connects into the campus-wide systems uh, for stormwater management. In particular, this is a project that will, um, in addition to having on-site stormwater management strategies for green infrastructure, will connect to the um, detention system that's part of the Poe Field um, basin that will be uh, under construction. This is that uh, diagram of public circulation that I mentioned. We really want to make it um, cognitively fluid and easy to connect through this building. And so this entrance at the southwest corner, the new entrance on Goheen Walk, uh, right outside, as you pass through the lobby here, you'll immediately encounter a multi-story space 
and a staircase that takes you along that east elevation with daylight and landscape to your right as you're moving from south to north, arriving at really the most active teaching level of the building. Um, there's a, a lot of faculty offices and research groups in the building, but it's also an intensive workhorse for, for large, lab, large lectures and classrooms for computer science. So it'll arrive right here, pretty much at the intersection to a passageway to the existing Geo Hall and a connection to that historic commons and then out to the north side to that east-west connector. So that, that spine, that connection will take a really large building and make it very easy to understand and navigate. And it's also important from the faculty point of view that they, they have a sense that they're in one home. They were very concerned that they didn't feel or that their students would not feel lost as they try to navigate from different parts of the building. It is a complicated building, uh, lots of levels and lots of different departments. I'm not going to go through this, but just to say that the, the red here are the are typically faculty office or administrative offices, and the green are um, classrooms and lecture rooms and, and, and seminar rooms and things like that. And then the sort of teal color are some of the laboratories. Those are, again, dry laboratories, not, not wet laboratories. Um, we're mindful of the situation of the building in the context of um, the uh, uh, materials of the campus. So this this little um, these drawings show how um, Schmidt Hall sits in really the kind of brick fabric of the campus. Um, so while it's all brick, there's quite a range of colors in this part of the campus. So it goes from a kind of burgundy color at the McCosh Infirmary and Eno Hall to some oranges at Wu Hall and a little bit um, to the south of that. And so it's a variety of, of bricks. And we're just, this collage at the lower part situates it in the vocabulary of the overall campus. So the challenge for the, for the design team is to fit into that vocabulary between the more brownish and burgundy leaning color of the Geo Hall to the uh, redder color of Schultz Hall by Venturi, which is along Goheen. So we're trying to fit into this vocabulary of, of material with a, with a brick building. I'm gonna show you a couple precedent studies uh, because we're still design, designing and developing the facade, but the building will be um, intentionally rather quiet as a building. It's, it's I think it as a kind of a noble partner to Gio, which as I said, is a bold and uh, ornate collegiate Gothic building. This building does not wanna compete with that. It wants to be deferential to that historic building. And so it is a simple frame. Uh, it'll have an infill panel, which is what these, uh, these photographs are showing you. That infill panel allows the frame to express itself, but also gives us a reduction in the uh, amount of glass, which is a more sustainable strategy. So you'll see in, a couple, in the next couple of slides, uh, the, the early development of that strategy of a frame with an infill panel and the sort of uh, sim simple elegance of a loft-like building that's gonna be a great partner to the existing loft-like interior of Geo Hall. Uh, at the base of the building, however, we do wanna sort of um, uh, find more opportunities for articulation and expression to, to um, play into the craft quality of Princeton buildings in general, and particularly the heavy craft of, um, of, of Geo. And so we're looking at um, a sort of articulated uh, strategy of the brick uh, uh, coursing uh, and texture at the ground level of the building. These are precedent studies, again, that are inspirations that we're pursuing. So this is the west elevation, <clears throat> uh, just a sort of a drawing showing how that building is intended to be deferential to uh, Gio. It sits below uh, the towers of Gio and below the upper levels of Gio. And it really is a quiet and elegant uh, loft-like building that fills out that block and creates the sort of um, uh, sort of highly functional spaces that we need for the, for the interior. And it will be, as I said, um, a mass timber uh, a structure predominantly. This little, the connection to the existing Geo building is a kind of delicate glass link uh, that we call the dash. And uh, on the right, just explain this drawing, you're looking obliquely of that facade along uh, Goheen Walk as, you, as, it, as, it, as it goes on the diagonal. So you're seeing a bit of Schmidt Hall in the foreground and then uh, Schultz Hall in the background there. And it'll be originally landscaped in this connection. So we're looking through that space between health services and the addition to Schmidt. 
these are some uh, current st state of the renderings uh, of, of the progress of the design. You can see the, the frame structure here with the infill panel to reduce the solar heat gain, particularly from, from the west and the sort of uh, quiet nature of this addition relative to, to GEO. And at the southwest corner, uh, the building has a kind of, again, a proud location, but still is a, a sort of quiet as it sits between Schultz, which is a more ornate uh, postmodern building, and GEO, which is the collegiate Gothic building. This shows the new entrance at that southwest corner onto Goheen Walk. And these are some more some details of the language of brick and masonry that's em, that's emerging. A slight changes in color to articulate that infill panel, and the um, uh, studies of the articulation of the brick at the base to give it that craft and character. On the inside courtyard, we've done a little bit of a flip in the color scheme, recognizing that the limestone of uh, of the historic Geo building is a very dominant feature, particularly on the courtyard side. And also wanting to make the courtyard as light and airy as possible, we've um, flipped the vocabulary to a light colored brick that picks up the color of the limestone. That brings a lot of light into the space, makes it a sort of attractive space as, as long th through the day as possible. And you'll see here uh, the lower courtyard, the upper terrace, and through, this, through these windows here, you'll see that stair that comes up from the entrance at the southwest up to this uh, terrace level and into the historic commons, which is, which is right through here. So that's that main teaching level at that commons level. This is a, a view in the commons. Now we're looking to the west. So the right uh, is the two-story or those extra tall windows that look out toward Frist Lawn and the Frist Campus Center. And this is um, basically uh, reclaiming the character and, uh, and daylight that was in that space when it was a museum uh, in 1909. You'll see a, a new accessible ramp that connects to that stair tower. So we're making the entrance to the stair tower accessible. And then once you come in the stair currently, there's a semi a salt, short flight of steps that brings you into the commons. We'll provide an accessible ramp that navigates that difference of grade from the entrance to the commons level. Uh, that's looking back at that at that accessible ramp. So we're looking back to the to the north a little bit to the northeast. So one would come up that ramp and circle back to the entrance here. That 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 portal there would take you to the stair tower on your left. And then this is an opportunity, as I said, the the uh, south facade is uh, reclaimed and restored both on the interior and the exterior. So on the interior here, as you're transitioning from that. Um, historic common space into the new addition, you'd pass through the windows, the former windows, uh, into the new uh, addition of Schmidt Hall. Now we're at that terrace level, so this, is, this would give access to the terrace, and you can see the mass timber construction dominating the, uh, the look and feel of the addition. We've now just turned around a little bit. We've come from the uh, Geo Hall through that portal of the historic facade looking down to the to the south toward Goheen Walk. The terrace and landscapes are all on our left. You see the mass timber, mass timber construction, which really adds warmth and reinforces the loft light quality. On the right, uh, this is the wall of the large lecture hall, which is on that level, and a lot of uh, casual seating and common space uh, organized along this walkway. Um, that's really it. I'm going to end here on this slide and I will uh, stop the slides and um, uh, just for conversation and happy to pull back any other images that you'd like to see as we have questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I know that Mr. Cohen's hand is going to go up. <laughs> <laughs> I can see him. Uh, <laughs> It's I really, wanted to really give somebody else project. a chance to talk first for once, but I have a bunch of comments ready if nobody else is ready. <laughs> um, uh, other folks, anybody want to jump in before Mr. Cohen? Okay, go ahead, David. So um, I really like the project. Um, I especially want to praise, I think, that the... Um, you know, the simple frame with, but with the infill panels is really successful. It richens 
that facade without overly um, complicating it. It also gives an opportunity with the two different colors of brick to make a connection, you know, to um, uh, to Geo Hall without having the new brick be immediately adjacent, you know, to the old brick and having problems with color matching and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I, I like that a lot. Um, obviously, very happy about the sustainability strategies. Um, one comment that I want to make is I was really struck by the dinosaur uh, skeleton in one of the photos of the, the old common space. And it just suggests to me that that common space is of a scale that could really benefit from some kind of a large sculptural piece in it. And so I'm throwing that out as a, as a suggestion. Um, that, those, are, those, those are what rise to the top for me. Um, I'm not saying I don't have any other comments, but I'll stop for now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank other you. comments or, or questions for Mr. McCoy? Mr. O'Donnell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, no, I really, I really like this. I think, I think it's really nice. I, I like the, uh, the, the reuse of uh, GEO, and I think that uh, reopening that space to the way it is is a, a beautiful um, use of of the space itself um you described the uh the glass link which i really i really like i think that's that's a really nice um uh, really nice view is that going to be bird proof glass by any chance are you considering that yes yes uh we are considering bird proof glass i have to go back to the team to see if we have uh what, what the extents of bird a bird safe glass are on this right. building but, okay uh, thank, that's a good that's a good comment Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and also the um, the courtyard, the level B courtyard, is that only going to be accessible from within the building itself? There's no outdoor, you know, you have to go Correct. through it in order to get to it. Correct. Uh, so it's a bit of a secret garden, but this is yeah. an extremely busy building. So yes, yes, there are no direct connections from outdoors. So you either go into the public lobby at the southwest corner or the uh, historic commons to get to it. Okay. Okay, and just finally, I'm just, uh, you know, the, the proposed timeline, I know you're, you're still in the planning, but I'm also not just the, the timeline for this particular construction, but how it fits in with the, uh, the new health services building and Hobson College. Uh, you know, how are these going to mesh together? Because uh, that's, that's an awful lot of work being done in one relatively small area. Yes, we know that. Yeah, I'm uh, sure you do. <laughs> That's why I'm asking you. <laughs> the sequence, the sequence is this is the planned sequence. You know, we're living in still uncertain times with uh, supply chain issues and the volatile markets uh, and things like that. But the plan is to complete uh, environmental studies and seize in the spring of uh, 2025. And then to move those people who are currently in GEO out. Prior to that, we will have been, been, been able to do a fair amount of pre-work on the building, but then they will vacate. Um, in June of 24, UHS will open. So UHS will be open before, just before we start construction on this. And then this will be finished in, in the summer of 2027. So uh, you'll finish UHS, pretty much um, uh, start um, this building in the following spring uh, when the UH, when the existing occupants can move to their new homes in environmental studies on Ivan Lane and Western Way. So it is it is quite a lot of work. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Owen. Ms. Capazzoli? Hi, I'll be brief. I just think this is a textbook example of how you meld new construction with existing historic buildings and you know it's it's perfect <laughs> so <laughs> it's really really fantastic job and um according to the uh secretary of the interior standards this is top notch really great thank you thank you it's a great opportunity 
Yeah, uh, Mr. Cohen. Yeah, I just thought of one other thing that I wanted to say, which is one of the things I'm most excited about with this project is the parts of the building that are being demolished because um, <laughs> you're removing the evidence of a time when the university was not lavishing the kind of design attention on the campus that they were prior to that era and, mm -hmm. and subsequent to that era. And it's really great to, um, to see those go. Thank you. That's another opportunity. You know, universities everywhere have these phases they go through where they they <laughs> abuse sometimes the beautiful buildings on campus uh, because you have to advance research. And then another generation comes along and you have an opportunity to undo that and restore things and clean them up. So this is another opportunity for that. We're very, very, and that, that be able to, to be able to create that courtyard space and a sense of home and really transform this building is, is fantastic. Um, I, I agree with everything that's been said. Um, I, just a few quick things. Um, first of all, when I'm as old as Geo Hall, I hope somebody calls me <laughs> crusty, bold, and ornate. <laughs> um, I, I, you, uh, um, we'll talk about stormwater management when you come back. Um, and I would just encourage you to find as many ways as possible to make the site itself absorbent, um, such that it, you know, will manage an inch or an inch and a half before anything uh, uh, overflows into detention. Um, I just think that. Um, being able to use a, a really, really interesting project like this to also showcase uh, absorbency <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is is good for everybody. It's it's good for the town, obviously. It's good for Princeton. Um, and the only thing that struck me um, as you know potentially, hmm, I wonder how that will work, is the very light. Um, interior space, courtyard space. It mm -hmm. struck me that with um, so much uh, white brick and patio area that light might get in there and bounce around and just be overwhelming when you walk out into it. <laughs> so I'm sure that um, your design folks are smart enough to address that and there will be lots of vegetation in there and and um, but I just wanted to call that. It struck me as, you know, potentially, um, you know, an issue for uh, in, enjoying that space if there was so, so much brightness that it um, was hard on some days to handle. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good comment. We will we will definitely look at that. Um, I could say, thank goodness we're in New Jersey and not San Diego, but I don't feel that. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and our landscapes are, are robust. And so um, I think for the comfort of people, they will be beneath a kind of, um, I think the low, particularly the lower, the lower landscape, will, because there we can put trees in soil and get some nice canopies. Uh, that upper terrace, um, to be honest, would would not have the advantage of those those nice canopy of trees, and so there'll be different environments for for different times of year. And if you seek shade, we'll make sure that there's spaces for you to seek shade in the in the lower terrace. But we'll we'll we'll, we'll study the light as you suggest. Okay. Great. And, well, and, any and um... Ms. Wilson, I believe that uh, Mr. McCoy's full quote was crusty and ornate, but we love it. So <laughs> he said crusty and old and ornate, but then later he said bold. So I added that. <laughs> um, okay, great. Well, thank you. Thank you again. It's a very, very interesting project um, with a lot to recommend it. And obviously board members have, have uh, expressed a, a lot of interest and, uh, and, appreciation for this project. So great. Thank you. And we will and we'll come back with a, a, a very robust um, consideration of all the stormwater opportunities as you suggest also. Great. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll see you Bye. next time. Okay. Awesome. Take care.
Bye -bye. Okay. Thank bye you. bye. Okay, next up uh, on the agenda, just noting that the um, what was originally scheduled for review, the concept plan, Jimmy and Merlin Iodele uh, minor subdivision at 469 Ewing Street is being carried to um, December 1st. And so next up, we have an application, Nassau 195 LLC. This is uh, continued from um, last week, uh, October 6th, preliminary and final major site plan with variances, 195 Nassau Street and 9-11 Charlton Street uh, and 13 Charlton Street, block 47.01, lots 23, 26, and 27. This is file number P2222-232P. Um, Mr. Letizia, I know we've had some, some, um, correspondence back and forth about between, uh, your office and Mr. DeGrazio on behalf of the university about the circulation, uh, ingress and egress rights and whatnot. Um, I think that unless our own attorney or professionals have something to say first. I'm not seeing anybody indicate that they do. <laughs> I think it would be good to just put that to bed um, and then move on with, with your next um, witness, Mr. Leticia. So. Uh, sure. I think, I think that, well, I'll let you, um, summarize where we are right now with the with Adam this particular Chair, question. Derek, Derek has his oh, hand up. Oh, hi, remember. Derek. Sorry, I did not see your hi, hand. Madam Chair. Please. Um, regarding the easement agreement, um, I spoke to Jim <clears throat> Purcell about this, and staff is happy to review the, the meets and bounds, uh, whatever the description of the easement is, but we don't want to be involved in the actual negotiation of the easement. and. That's something that should be worked out between the applicant and the objector and, and, and any approvals, if there is one, should be subject to an agreement that's acceptable to those two parties, but staff in the town does not want to be in the middle of a negotiation regarding the easement agreement. Here, here. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you for being explicit about that. Uh, Mr. Leticia? Uh, yes. Uh... For the record, Tom Letizia, attorney for the applicant, Nassau 195 LLC. As you indicated, uh, Madam Chair, we put in most of our testimony. Uh, we just have one more uh, witness. Uh, but at, at your suggestion, I, I can first address uh, the issue uh, raised by the university related to uh, access. You may recall there is an existing uh, easement um, on this property uh, for the uh, parking uh, on the adjacent uh, university property lot 24. Uh, after uh, last week's uh, meeting, uh, we, uh, we had further discussions uh, with the university and uh, their attorney, uh, Mr. DeGrazia, and I'm happy to report uh, that we have reached agreement. And it's essentially along the, uh, the lines that um, we talked about at last week's meeting. And that is that uh, my client is agreeable to uh, putting on a new easement through what I would call a declaration of easement on the property that will essentially provide a, a modified access rights uh, for the users of, uh, of Lot 24 uh, and it will follow uh, the new access that's being uh, provided as part of this project. In other words, uh, they will come in uh, from uh, Charlton, just like all the residents of this new project, and they will have the right to leave uh, uh, egress out onto Charleston, just like our residents. And we will also agree that if for some reason that egress out to Charleston is blocked, uh, they will have the right 
that is the university uh, property uh, users will have the right uh, to uh, egress out to uh, NASA Street, just like uh, our residents. Uh, there are some other terms uh, that we've worked out uh, that we've shared with uh, Mr. Mueller that, that could be part of a condition. I, I don't need to go into all the details. Again, I, I can report that uh, I, Mr. DeGrazi, have reached agreement on that. Um, and uh, so, I mean, unless you have more questions, I think we, we, we've essentially accommodated what the university has asked for. Anything to, that you want to add, Mr. DeGrazia? No, I, I think Tom covered it very nicely. Um, I had proposed some language to uh, Mr. Mueller and Mr. Letizia. Tom had some suggested changes. I found the changes to be acceptable and reasonable. And I and I you know I mentioned back to him that um, if you got if the board finds this acceptable and puts this as a condition in the resolution, our um, concerns with regard to access are addressed. Excellent. Thank you for. Um, yeah, Christopher, let me just ask you this. In one of your conditions, um, bullet points, um, and I circulated, and Tom, I don't know if I told you this, I circulated both Christopher's uh, email and your email to all the board members, or Kerry did at the very end of the day. So they have that at least in front of them. That second bullet says approved, this is the easement approved by the municipal attorney, which is what we had discussed uh, the last time. But do you have any problem taking that out? I mean, certainly Derek su suggests that the staff doesn't want to be involved. The board attorney can review it, um, which is what you would want it early on. But I have no problem taking it out if you're comfortable with that. I, I think I put in the board attorney and the legal description by the municipal, municipal engineer. Yeah. So, so there would just be limited right. to the legal description. And Jerry, your review would be just to make sure it adequately presents safe egress and egress and as to form. And that's all we were looking for. Okay, that's, that's fine. Yeah, I agree with that. So instead of a municipal attorney, you'll say board attorney. Yep, okay, okay. sounds good. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Yeah, did I say municipal attorney? I meant, did, uh, but, uh, yes, I, I, meant, uh, I meant Jerry Muller. Okay, right. great. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Good. So Madam Chair, while we're still on the university, I mind at this point also put on the record, and, and again, this was at the request of, of their attorney, uh, just to make it clear that they also had a, a, a comment in their prior correspondence about a clear uh, demarcation of the uh, shared boundary uh, between our property and Lot 24. And we, we do agree, and I'll state on the record that we will clearly uh, uh, demark delineate the property boundary with both fencing and curbing and that our our plans will reflect that and then uh finally related to the uh the buffer on the south boundary as you know <clears throat> that boundary is shared with uh university owned uh, residences and uh you know we we are committed that that buffer will provide adequate a screening and we agree to work with your staff to make sure that that screening is uh, is uh, appropriate and will uh, reasonably screen from any uh, uh, vehicle lighting. Uh, as you know, there is two parking spaces proposed in the buffer. We wanna make sure that uh, headlights are not glaring uh, and spilling over into those residential properties. And we're committed to uh, making sure that that's a sufficient buffer. And Tom, where, is, that, is that at the southern end of the, of the property? Is that what you said? Yes, yeah. southern boundary. Mm -hmm. Okay, now let me ask you this in terms of the demarcation. Um, there was discussion at the last meeting that cars coming in or off Charlton and getting into the parking garage would have, have a little jog. And the point was made that, well, that's just a paved area, that the corner uh, of the university property that they'd have to jog around is just a paved, an open paved area, and they could use that. With the demarcation, would that not be the case anymore? That's correct. It would be, we're not planning on using any of, uh, of the university property. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and Madam Chair? Those, that's exactly what we discussed, just for the record, and uh, that those, those comments would satisfy the concerns that I raised in my initial letter. 
right? You know, at, at having a demarcation, the fence or the curb, and um, because we do have you know duplexes and smaller size scale residents in the back, we were concerned with um, you know headlights or the the bulk of the building and with a, a good faith commitment to work with municipal staff to do adequate landscaping back there to protect those residences that's all we're asking for and we're very happy to see the project and uh, i just wanted to make that uh, a part of the record i'm just wondering if for the sake of um safety and um practicality if that demarcation of the um of the lot in the area that's all paved you're saying is going to be a raised curb now instead of allowing someone coming in to just sort of go over a corner of the Princeton property on their way into the entrance to the parking area do I do I have that wrong I don't, I'm, it's not even clear to me what would be fenced and what would be curbed. Uh, Jeffrey, can you uh, address this? Yeah, I, I, I can. Um, we had suggested that a fence be put at the majority of that, <clears throat> excuse me, of that common property line. And at the, at the end of that area um, where Ms. Wilson is describing that that property demarcation would be curb. It doesn't have to be raised curb, but just so that it was very clear as to where you are on that, whether you are on the university's side of that property or on our side, uh, <clears throat> just so that that lot line was, was very clear. And yeah, we yeah. so you can make the lot line visible, but not make it so that people are gonna, you know, scrape their tires or run up over the curb or otherwise, you know, um, run into trouble if they're trying to make, you know, an efficient approach to the uh, to the entrance of the parking lot. Do you see what I'm saying? I, it's hard for me to describe without looking at a, we, a map we, on the screen, but. Yeah, we can put up a plan okay. if that would be, um, if that would make some sense. If, if a plan could be put up, that would be great. Yeah. Uh, Paul Winters, our engineer, I believe, can uh, pull up a, a plan for us. I guess I just want to be clear while, while that plan is being put up. We have no intention on making great use of the university's property. That yes, is not the, that's not the intent here. The intent is it, it be safe and it be clear as to where the property line is. Yes, that is exactly. Uh, and I think you can make completely clear where the property line is without pre without putting a raised curb, which as I understand it, you're saying, you know, can be avoided such that people who are coming in off of Charlton Street can sort of, you know, diagonally get into the entrance uh, to the so, parking so area without... I'll let the engineer discuss this, but I, it's not necessary to use any of that of lot 24 in order to get into our garage. However, as a practical matter, both for the for, both for the uh, 199 Nassau, which is the university's property, and for ours, it's it's not practical to have a fence directly onto the on the edge of that. I guess I can't remove my cursor here, but if somebody could could uh, could show that right at the right at that corner to have a high fence there is just impractical. As a matter no, of course, that's sense. not that really is not going to work. So what we've suggested is that the majority of that area be fenced, and the la and the last the last portion to the to where the property line makes a um, a ninety degree turn. That be um, that be clearly delineated with curb. Again, it does not have to be raised curb, such that it's impossible to to traverse. But it would nonetheless make make very clear uh, which property is which. And that is where people who are parking at the Princeton building behind the Princeton building would would enter there, right? 
Correct. And so, exit, okay. and exit, right? Yeah, and, Madam yes. Chair. Enter and exit, right. That's right. Okay. So, so, so Madam Chair, if I may just comment on that. Mm -hmm. So the concern with the university's property is that the university from time to time redevelops property, makes changes, and there is a concern that um, as a soft corner, which is what we heard at the last meeting and we objected to, the university may have the entrance shift a little, have a picnic table in the area, have landscaping in the future. The whole idea is that this project should not depend on the neighbor's property to function. And I believe the applicant has said it functions perfectly fine with circulation, does not need any of the neighboring property. Right now there are um, parking wheel stops that sort of pro prohibit the crossover. So there is a barrier. And we just wanna make sure that the proposed fence or some sort of curbing goes down so that if the university decides to have its own project or, or revitalize or change something in the back that the, the circulation plan of this project does not go over the property. It's, it's the university's yeah, and, property. And, the and, university, and we agree. Yeah, and we and agree. The applicant has agreed. And so that's okay. why we wanted a clear delineation so that we have the ability 60 years from now or 100 years from now when none of us are around to, you know, to utilize that portion of the property and not have someone say, oh, it's being used by your neighbor. <laughs> okay, yep, I, I, I understand so that. Sort of and, I, and I'm sorry if I'm seeming to dredge up um, a, a, an issue that should have been put to bed, but, um, and, and is agreed upon between the two parties, which is most important, but I just wanna make sure that we're not, you know, walking into, or creating a problem. Um, Mr. Cohen, and then Mr. Barry. Yeah, and I'm, well, I may have the same suggestion that Mr. Barry does, but um, one thing I'd like to have the applicant address is right now there's a sort of a sidewalk area inside of the garage uh, by the entry to the lobby, which seems quite wide, maybe seven feet. And uh, outside, of the entry to the garage, you know, there's a green space, a planted area that is not as wide. And I'm wondering uh, if the applicant could talk about whether just a minor shift in there to narrow that sidewalk so that it aligns with the green space uh, that's outside would be um, a problem for, you know, I'm not asking you to redo the entire plan, but it would, I would be a little more comfortable with the notion that that corner of the university's property is not needed at all if that kind of a minor change were made to the plan. And I'd just like to hear the applicant address that. Uh, I think it's best addressed by me, Tom Barton. Um, we can um, move that um, dry aisle over about about where the curb is shown currently, um, where the green area is with the curb. Um, farther than that creates a problem with safety for the exit entrance from the lobby. Um, so I have to maintain uh, a dimension there so this person can walk out without walking into a drive aisle from the lobby. But there's enough room there that I could probably move it three or four feet. I don't know the exact dimension, but roughly that over to the uh, towards the lobby. And I don't think that presents a problem um, for Thanks. us at all. Thanks, Mr. Barton. I think that would be helpful. Great. I agree. Uh, Mr. Barry? Um, Mr. Cohen, thank you for bringing that up. That would actually uh, relieve my concern that comes up again around around that reduced corner. Um, so if, if Mr. Barton and, uh, and the... Uh, and the Bowler team were to do that, I think a lot of our other issues can be put to rest. And Mr. Albert, um, I'm sure your your engineering team uh, can close their eyes and conjure up a mountable curb detail um, that- uh, Even will... I can do that. 
Don't take um, all my fun, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that should uh, that should address um, containing your proposed pavers and defining the limits of your real estate against Princeton's. Um, so that's I exactly right. Okay. Um, I I can't say that that reduces all of my office's uh, concerns. We we our concerns remain um, as. But you guys are, are taking strides to address them. We'll continue to work on refining them moving forward. And if just pardon me for being dense, but the idea is there'll be a fence all along the driveway that goes to Nassau Street to that corner. Um, and then there'll be mountable curbs as it turns the cor corner at the 90 degree angle towards Charlton. Is uh, to, to uh, not not quite it, right. Mr. Sorry, sorry, Mr. Albert. Uh, Mr. Sorry. Muller, I, I believe um, Mr. Albert's proposal is to run that curb from the brown roof building on Nassau Street, or run the fence from that brown roof building on Nassau Street along the black asphalt to that white hatch where the pavers would start. And then we, I believe Mr. Albert's mountable curb would start there around that go make that 90 degree turn and then go up the entrance aisle to Charlton Street. It, please, Mr. Albert, I apologize for speaking out of turn. No, 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 if I'm wrong. No, you 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 did an admirable job of explaining it exactly right. And how so far does the, does the does the fence pick back up uh when the asphalt picks back up in the entrance area or is it just curb all the way out to Charlton? There already is a fence there. Uh, okay. That that area right there is a is a small little best pocket park, okay. and so there already is some fence in that lo location. Okay. And and the way the university people using the university property now get in and out is on the Charlton Street side, right near the um, the jog where it jogs to uh, to NASA. Correct. Yes, that's okay. right. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so far. Right. Uh, do you have anything else? Okay, I see you put your hand down. Um, Mr. DeGrazia, did you have something? Yeah, I just want to comment, say it's, it, that sounds good from the university's perspective. Again, the sole purpose is that if the university decides to do something, if they want to put a fence on their own property, that there's nothing prohibiting because <clears throat> this property is not part of this application they can put a fence on their property so long as they meet the municipal you know, standards for fence if they want to do so in the future. And as, as long as that's the understanding and that curb delineates it, I think that we're, we're satisfied with that. Great. So thank you to the applicant and to the board. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, I'm really glad we can shift the entrance and exit to the garage over to the right three or four feet. I think that'll really help. Um, so Mr. Leticia, do you want to introduce your next witness? Uh, yes, uh, and he's our last. Uh, so uh, there is gonna be an end to this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, William uh, Hamilton. Good evening, everybody. There he is. I assume you were sworn in already, Mr. Hamilton. Last yes, I was. He was. Okay, good. Um, uh, Mr. Hamilton, uh, please provide uh, your uh, educational and professional credentials, please. Sure, I'd be happy to. So my name is Bill Hamilton. I'm a principal with Bowman Consulting. I'm a licensed professional planner, as well as a licensed landscape architect in New Jersey and a member of the American Institute of Certified Planners. I've been working in the field. I should start off by saying I graduated from Rutgers University back in 1989 or 1979 uh, with a degree in environmental planning and design. I've been working in the field for well over 30 years. I've been licensed since 1985. I've worked on many projects of a similar nature that the one that's before you this evening. Uh, majority of my work is in the private sector, although I also am a municipal planner up in Stanhope, New Jersey. I offer uh, Mr. Hamilton as an expert in land use planning. 
Thank you. We accept your qualifications. Thank you. So, Mr. Hamilton, uh, please explain what was your role with uh, this application. So, my job as planner was to look at particularly the two variances that are associated with the application uh, that you've heard testimony on uh, throughout the proceedings. Um, one is with regard to building height, there's a 50 foot requirement. We are at 54.8, as you've heard. And then we have a landscape buffer uh, easement as well. 15 feet is required, and we're down to 3.75 feet um, in the minimum area of, of that variance. Now, most variances are relief from NJSA 40 colon 55 D 70 C2, uh, which are typically referred to as C2 variances. So, my job was to to look at the planning justification for those variances, uh, because you've heard in, in other testimony, particularly about the variances themselves. And uh, have you reached certain conclusions uh, upon your uh, review of all the testimony and application materials? I have. So if I could just start by talking first about the building height, um, and first looking at the positive criteria, a C2 variance relief can be granted where a purpose of planning will be advanced by the granting of the deviation and the benefits of the deviation will substantially outweigh any detriments. And there's a number of purposes of planning that are advanced with respect to uh, this variance request. The first is the purpose of encur encouraging municipal action to guide the appropriate use or development of lands in this state in a manner which will promote the public health, safety, morals, and general welfare. Uh, this is a minor height relief will allow, and it allows more affordable units uh, on the property. Affordable units and affordable housing in general promotes um, the goal of general welfare. Um, we're also promoting the, pur the purpose of establishment of appropriate population densities and concentration that will contribute to the well-being of persons, neighborhood, communities, and regions. Uh, the added height will allow for an increase in the density with the result of supporting a more vibrant and walkable downtown as well as additional affordable units for the project. Uh, thirdly, we're, uh, the purpose of promoting a desirable visual environment through creative development techniques and good civic design and arrangement. Uh, the additional height will allow the new project to mirror the smaller Victoria in front of the existing buildings on site with the larger neighboring university building next door uh, and maintain a smaller scale building frontage on Nassau Street, as you've heard Mr. Barton uh, describe in his testimony. And finally, the purpose of promoting the conservation of historic sites and districts, open space, energy resources, and valuable natural resources in the state, and to prevent urban sprawl and the degradation of the environment through improper use of the land. So by concentrating the development in this case uh, to the center and rear of the site, as you've heard testimony to, the buildings around the perimeter are maintained. In addition, the higher density is achieved through the minor height relief, reducing urban sprawl, the need for greenfield development, and provides an increase to the energy efficiency of the proposal. Now, with any variance, we also, in addition to the positive criteria, have to address the negative criteria, uh, wherein the board must find that each of the variants can be granted without substantial detriment to the public good and with, without substantially impairing the intent and purpose of the zone plan and zoning ordinance. In that regard, I note the following. Proposed residential building will be screened by the existing structure and significantly set back from both Nassau Street as well as Charlton Street. The 4.8 feet of additional building height will not be discernible uh, to the public on either of these streets as we've heard testimony to uh, prior to this evening. Uh, the proposed building will be in character with the existing large buildings in the area and spe specifically the Princeton University building uh, referred to as the Lewis Center for the arts, which is adjacent to the site. Uh, the project also advances the planning purposes and goals in the master plan by providing affordable housing in the downtown area of Princeton at a higher and permissible density. The proposal respects all of the standards of the AHO-1 zone with the exception 
uh, of the minor relief sought and discussed uh, here tonight. So with regard to the landscape buffer, uh, again, this is a C2 uh, variant situation. The dense planted buffer, as you've heard from Mr. Winters, replaces an existing gravel parking area and the relief is requested for only a minimal portion of the proposed buffer. The spaces correspond to the existing garage on the adjacent lot, thereby reducing the visual impact uh, of the encroachment. Uh, there's, a, there's also a number of purposes that are advanced here with this uh, variance uh, relief request. Uh, the first is, again, the purpose of promoting general welfare, proposed encroachment into the buffer for just a portion uh, for just a portion of the two parking spaces is minor and will allow for conforming project parking uh, and the promotion, obviously, of general welfare. Uh, it also promotes the purpose of uh, ur uh, promoting urban sprawl and degradation of the environment, uh, as was the height variance, providing parking for the higher density, as stated, reduces urban sprawl, reduces the need for greenfield development, and increases the energy efficiency of the building. With respect to the negative criteria, uh, it won't provide uh, any substantial detriment to the public good. The proposed extensively planted buffer will be a substantial improvement over the existing gravel parking lot. The visual impact of the intrusion will be further mitigated by the location of its encroachment behind an existing garage, as Mr. Winters previously described and shown, uh, shown to you. Uh, it will also not substantially intent, uh, impair the zoning ordinance uh, and the zone plan. Uh, the master plan identifies certain goals that are advanced with this application. They include a provision to continue to provide the community its fair share of affordable housing. The town in its 2017 master plan update continues to identify affordable housing as an area of community need. So granting the minor height and landscape buffer relief will assist the community in meeting their desired need of providing affordable housing. Uh, now you heard testimony, I believe from Mr. Um, Winters with respect to the waivers associated with the project. And there's really, there's two. Uh, one is from uh, Princeton Code section T10B203B, which requires a minimum parking aisle of 24 feet where 22 feet is proposed. And you've heard testimony from our engineers of why this is acceptable and why the 22 feet is appropriate and safe in this context of this application. Uh, we also finally have a de minimis exception with respect to the RSIS, and that's from section 5, 21-4.14. And that's a requirement for the number of parking spaces. 88 spaces are required under RSIS. 38 spaces are provided that those 38 spaces are conforming to your Princeton ordinance, uh, section B17A-415. So we believe the parking to be adequate giving the sites walkability, bicycle class test, close proximity to mass transit, and for all the reasons that were addressed in previous testimony. Thank you, Mr. Hamilton. Uh, Madam Chair, that completes our direct uh presentation. All of our uh, experts are available tonight. So uh, for, for questions from the board staff, as well as from the public. Okay, thank you. Um, questions from the board for Mr. Hamilton? I do have a question about the, um, the variance for the intrusion into the side yard setback. Um, there was previous testimony by most, both Mr. Barry and the traffic uh, expert for, uh, or maybe with Mr. Winters, um, for the applicant, that those two spaces on the right side, were, is, is that the easterly spaces? South. South. Okay, southerly spaces are really problematic and very difficult to get in and out. Um, wouldn't it make, I throw out the, the idea that, that it might make more sense just to eliminate those two spaces eliminate the need for that variance and get a variance from, from the parking requirements. Because the spaces don't seem to be doing anything other than satisfy parking requirements. Well, so I, I think you heard testimony, Mr. Muller, with respect to those spaces. Um, they're probably gonna be the last two spaces that, are, that people choose or residents choose under the building. Um, 
but there was testimony that people could back out of those spaces and adequately, you know, turn turn out into the the traveled way. Um, so, uh, you know, I think it's better to have them. I, I think they'll be used in, as a last resort, but I think they are spaces that it's better to have than not to eliminate them at this point. I actually have a I have a suggestion that might be a compromise that may may work all around. And that is to make those two spaces compact spaces, which would make them narrower um, and easier to maneuver in and out of. Um, we could we could maintain those two spaces, which I think are still valuable, but yet make them much more safe uh, and and uh, accessible. So could we would we would propose that if that was uh, if that would be acceptable. Yeah, it's a good thought. Yeah, it is a good thought, um, Mr. Cohen. Yeah, and I've, I've been thinking about those two spaces a little. I, I actually wanted to make the point, and Derek, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the parking setback, you know, within the residential zone is, I think, only four feet. And while I understand that there's this 15-foot buffer that's supposed to be required between this, this zone and the residential adjacent zone, because the scale of those two spaces is pretty, uh, you know, single family in character, I think that it comes close. I, I'm comfortable with this variance for uh, breaking the the 15 foot buffer at that point because the intrusion feels in character with what else happens in the residential zone there. Um. And there's been testimony about um, a landscape buffer in that uh, th three plus feet. <laughs> um, but is there a fence that exists there already? Uh, I don't know if it's already there. Uh, do you know that, Mr. Albert? There's a there, there, there's what we propose is a fence through part of that area, and okay. and the balance of it to be a living fence or landscaping. Okay, but the, but there will be a fence uh, separating the neighbors from the headlights. Oh, if, is that if there what you're is saying, not, or if there's not one throughout that entire area, we'd be happy to to add that. Um, we thought landscaping would be more appropriate, but uh, we can do both. Well, uh, the neighbors might have something to say about it too. But I mean, if I lived right next to it, I think I'd um, just you know from a belt and suspenders. <laughs> approach to I not understand. having headlights into my living room or where whatever room well, but, be, 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 I, I thought I be, understood there's a garage right there. I was just going to say that. Oh, be, it's be, a garage. Okay. Be mindful okay. that there's a garage that's directly adjacent to the two parking spaces. So um, a good okay. deal of the headlight um, light pollution, if you will, if you will be blocked. But that even in other angles, we we hope to eliminated entirely with abundant landscaping. Okay, good. Well, I should have double checked the plans to see what was right there. And so I appreciate that clarification. I'll also comment that with Mr. Albert's suggestion that those become compact spaces, that should actually increase the, the width of the potential landscaping there because compact spaces are less steep as well yes. as being narrower. Correct, right. that's, that's exactly right. Good. Um, and so this application, I guess I'm proposing, uh, would come to the landscape subcommittee um, so that we could take a look at what the final plan is for the for that buffering and and not have to uh, go into excruciating detail tonight on that point. <laughs> Fully agree. Is that okay with folks? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, other questions from board members uh, for Mr. Hamilton or for Mr. Albert or any of the witnesses? If not, I will, I see there is a member of the public who has raised their hand already. I open this uh, meeting for public Com oh, sorry, I see Mr. Weissman has his hand up. So um, our land use engineer, Mr. Weissman, and I would just point out to the members of the public that I will um, 
open up for public comment shortly. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to want to speak, please raise your hand now. Mr. Weissman. Thank Dan, you, Madam Chair. Dan, uh, did, I, did I sway you in at the last session? Yes, you did. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you. Yeah, sorry, I jumped in late there. Um, the only comment that we had um, as part of our review memo that I haven't seen addressed is uh, screening for the parking lot for areas that are not in this within this this southern portion. Um, so I know that the, the plans indicate that there was a four foot fence around the perimeter of the parking lot. Um, but a section of the code does require screening for any parking lot from adjacent properties or other districts. Um, so I just wonder if there's any further details as to what that screening looks like. Um, the board does may permit suitable screening. So I just wondering what that fence looks like. Yeah, it's not so much a fence, but a, uh, I think uh, Tom Barton would, would best speak to this, but it is a, it's a decorative screen that screens the entire um, parking under the, under the building. So that any part, any, um, any car lights uh, emanating from the building will be blocked by that screen, um, much like you see in other, you know, in, in, in parking structures. So I don't know, Tom, if you want to, um, to explain that a little further, if needs be. Can um, you describe the screen? Yeah. The screen is um, basically runs around the entire perimeter of the garage, except where those two spaces we were just talking about um, project beyond the face of the building to the south. The screen itself is um, designed from the same material as the building. So it could be described as a fence or as a, uh, a piece of the facade, but essentially it uh, floats above the ground about um, eight inches, and then it goes up to um, four feet. Um, and then it, it is a, um, it is a, solid material that'll block block the the, the uh, headlights of the cars it still allows for natural ventilation above and below that screen um, there are sections of the garage that are fully enclosed either by stairwells or uh, bicycle storage in one area or um, other areas but that's about 20 to 25 to 30 percent of the perimeter the rest is this fence fence screen that I just described. Yeah, if I can just suggest from a terminology standpoint, I'd call it an architectural element <laughs> rather than a fence or a screen because both of those sound transparent. Um, yeah. Right. You know, and, and this is going to be visually solid, correct? That's correct. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that. that. That makes sense. Yeah, that is a great distinction to make. Thanks. Um, anything else, Mr. Weissman? Could I ask? Could I stand? You're satisfied with that, Dan? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so um, we have three members of the public with actually hands we had four. I already moved over Mr. McCarthy. So Kevin okay. McCarthy's already moved over, and I will start moving over the rest of the people. Great. And um, great. I was just gonna look for the um, countdown clock, <laughs> but I'm not actually seeing um, Mr. McCarthy yet. There we go. Uh, Mr. McCarthy, I, I know you've you've um, spoken to us before, but just as a reminder, Mr. Muller will swear you in and then ask for your full name, spell your last name, et cetera, and then you just go right ahead. Now, I'm sorry, is this, is this the point for, for a question of the witness or is this the final opinion section? You, well, that it, it's, I guess it's both because we just heard from the last uh, witness. So yes, if you have specific questions for Mr. Um, Hamilton, uh, based on the testimony that he just provided, you could certainly pose those questions. Yeah. I I had a, I have a quick question for Mr. Hamilton and if it's possible, I, I prefer to hold uh, the, the three minute opinion until a little bit later. Oh, okay, yes, great. sir. That, that's fine. And Madam Chair, I, I swore Mr. McCarthy in the, the last time. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just for Mr. Hamilton, quick question. The, uh, the additional height uh, that is being sought, uh, you, you said that would not be discernible to neighbors. I think that was uh, the way you put it. 
Uh, and, and I'm wondering, it, it's almost 10% of the building height. Why would that not be discernible? Well, I think my testimony was that it wouldn't be discernible to people traveling on both uh, Nassau Street or Charlton. Uh, and it's a factor that uh, Mr. Barton testified to. It's the location of the proposed building and the distance to those two. And the fact that it's it's less than five feet where 50 feet is provided. So in my opinion, as well as I believe testified to by the architect, it won't be discernible to those residents. Thank you, that was my question. Okay, so you wanna wait until later to, to speak or do, would you like to- Yes, please, uh, if, if I could, yes, please, thank you. Okay. Um, Peter Nagari, I just moved them over. Okay, great. Mr. Nogari, first of all, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. And if I'm not, please correct me. Um, secondly, if you could activate your camera and uh, unmute yourself, that would be great. Is my camera activated? No. Not yet. Now it is. Here we go. Okay. Yeah. Yes. If you, if you could raise your right hand, do, do you do you swear or affirm that testimony you're about to give will be the truth? Yes. So sworn or affirm. Please state your full name and spell your last name. My name is Peter D. Nogari, N-O-G-A-R-E. Okay. Great. Go right ahead, Mr. Nogari. Well, I think the scale of the project is totally out of proportion with the existing residential neighborhood. And I'm a little upset about how this was handled. I don't think it was transparent in that none of the neighbors that I have spoken to seem to have any recollection of what was going on here, nor had any idea of what the scope of the project was or could visualize the project. The only thing we've gotten in the mail was something about a height variance and now about a meeting. I find that very unusual and irregular. I don't really understand how that could be explained, but uh, I think the scope of this project is way out of proportion. And it seems like we're talking about the fit and the finish when we haven't even decided this would take place. I am the current property owner of block 4701, lot 28 and 29. It's directly to the south abutment of what used to be the Thompson land property, now owned by the current applicant. And I think you've, you've really belabored the point of traffic flow within the confines of the property, but I haven't heard anything about property, the, the traffic flow outside of the property namely on Nassau Street and specifically on Charlton Street, which as you all know is a one-way street. I've lived here for, I'm the fourth generation homeowner here. And I can tell you that the traffic on the street is incredible with deliveries and, and, and pedestrian traffic, bicycle traffic, scooters. It's just unbelievable. With a, a project, the scope of this size, I can only envision this is going to be a horrendous impact on this street and the neighborhood. In addition to the traffic flow, I think there's going to be a real safety issue. As you know, the university has, has uh, their students going up and down Charlton Street and William Street all hours of the day and all hours of the night, bicycles, scooters. And, you know, people zoom down Charlton Street. It's just, it, it's going to be a problem. And you've also talked about uh, headlights and light pollution. Well, I really think you're all missing the point. The headlights are gonna be a problem from people leaving this, this uh, complex, going out onto Charlton Street. You know, there are residents across the street and the headlights are going to be directly into their living areas. How do you propose to block that with landscaping and fencing? 
I think this is the point you have to look at. Well, thank you for also, your... Also, there's a, a very bad drainage problem on this gravel driveway where you're proposing this uh, three or four foot buffer zone. Whenever we have any type of rainstorm, it's totally flooded out. And keep in mind, now it's gravel and it's been tried, to, it's, it's, they tried to correct it for many years and were and, and, and unable to do it. If you're gonna have more impervious surface, it's gonna be a real problem. Well, let's uh, thank you for your for your comments. Um, there was quite a bit of testimony um, last week about traffic circulation, as you as you pointed out, both in the site, but also testimony as to traffic generated on Nassau and on um, uh, Charlton. And uh, sorry, I, I need to move something out of my, suddenly something came up on my screen. Um, and uh, I would invite the applicant to speak to whether the property that is right now um, under gravel that's adjacent to the neighboring uh, lot is, is uh, going to be more or less absorbent to you know speak to the drainage question, um, and then also I would invite one of our professionals or maybe Jerry's the right person or David I'm not quite sure to um, uh, opine a little bit on the zoning change that was adopted some time ago to allow for pretty much exactly <laughs> uh, what is proposed on this on this site. So um, thanks again, Mr. Nogari. We'll try to address at least some of what you were um, talking about. And before we hear from the next um, speaker, I think Mr. Floyd. All right, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. Thank you. So I don't think that we have to repeat the testimony about the traffic numbers um, uh, because that was you know, that was covered last week. Um, they are not overwhelmingly high numbers, but I would like to talk a little bit about the buffer area uh, and the vegetation that's proposed where right now there's um, uh, basically impervious uh, cover. And I also would like to hear a little bit more about the zoning context. Okay, uh, Mr. Winters, uh, can you address the uh, stormwater question, please? Uh, yes, I'd be happy to. Good evening, everybody. Um, the uh, the area that I believe uh, Mr. Nagari is speaking about is that area that's presently uh, serving as a parking lot. And it's it's not simply gravel. It's actually a very densely packed gravel parking lot based on my inspection of the area. Um, that entire gravel parking lot is going to be removed. Um, a small portion of it will be, uh, the minority portion of it will become part of the building footprint. Uh, and the balance of it, uh, with the exception of the small parking encroachment that we talked about with the variance earlier, the balance of that will be landscaped. So we're going to be taking that presently impervious area that's not able to recharge anything into the ground or absorb anything uh, and converting that into landscape space uh, it's, to the... It's not impervious. The, it, not, it will not be impervious anymore. We are reducing it's the overall gravel, impervious which, cover. It should accept water and absorb, but it does not, and it never has. I've lived here all my life. And well, Mr. Mr. Nogari, we, you've you've had your opportunity, and we and we took your okay, point. Now, you. is 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 answering you. And, and and to that point, sir, yes, the uh, that area won't be gravel anymore. The majority of that will be landscaped. We are also uh, proposing a few area drains, which are depicted on our submitted site plans, uh, to help pick up any excess surface runoff. So. I, I'm of the opinion that we're going to improve this existing condition that, that you're describing um, through the reduction in impervious cover, the reduction of those gravel areas, uh, and the addition of those small area drains to, uh, to help that condition. And um, Mr. Cohen or Mr. Lesko, I know this, this was uh, maybe before your time, but David, could you speak a little bit about the, the zoning? What, yeah, I don't mean to be putting you on the spot, but I know that this was um, a thought, you know, thought about and intentionally rezoned. 
Right. So, and I don't feel put on the spot. Um, you know, our a third round affordable housing settlement was a, a tough negotiation with Fair Share Housing Authority um, in a court setting. And one of the big points of contention was that the borough, uh, the former borough had an unmet need of about 225 um, affordable ha housing units that uh, were supposed to be provided and were not provided because of a of a an appeal process which said that there was no available land. But that um, that obligation continues to exist forever, uh, even though there was that open space um, allowance. And in the negotiation with Fair Share Housing, we agreed to impose overlay zones, three different overlay zones in the former borough, an AHO1, which this project is located in, an AHO2, which is generally in the Jugtown neighborhood near the intersection of Harrison and Nassau, and then an AHO3, which is uh, a single lot uh, on the corner of Nassau, and I forget what the name of the street is, but it's near the uh, Jewish Center, the Princeton Jewish Center. And so all of those overlay zones were, in order to reach a settlement, uh, imposed to try and meet some of that unmet need. And as Ms. Wilson said, the density that you're seeing on this site was what was contemplated when those overlay zones were negotiated. And they were put in place a couple of years ago now, I think. Um, so, um, a general, you know, a complaint about the, the level of density that we have with this application, it really would have been appropriate, you know, two years ago when that rezoning happened. But it was something that council felt um, we didn't really have a choice uh, in, um, in passing. And I, I think that the board, just to add a little bit to that, in, um, in, the adoption of the green building and environmental sustainability element of the master plan reaffirmed our commitment to um, bringing more people into living places in walkable areas of the town. Um, and that is going to translate uh, in, in redevelopment projects to increased density. And so we have these um, factors to weigh, scale, and um, there was intentional, the, the intentional decision made on this property to make sure that the height was not right on the street front, but, um, but back from it, um, so that there would be sort of a step up approach, um, visually less imposing, but still allowing for uh, more people. Um, and, and to preserve the existing streetscape. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I see that Ms. Phillip has brought over Mr. Floyd. Welcome. Thank you. Um, Mr. <coughs> uh, Muller will swear you in and then you can ask questions or or um, make your comments. You could raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth? I do. So I swear or affirm. Please state your full name and spell your last name. Michael Floyd, F-L-O-Y-D. Thank you. Yeah, before I get to my question, it's um, your most recent discussion uh, regarding the ordinance. It's just, it is interesting. It, it happened during the litigation. So, so much was behind the scenes and not noticed to the public. But the other thing when you, and correct me if I'm wrong, when you pass ordinances or when you're going to have the hearing, there is no notification of the most impacted 
immediate neighbors or whatever to that zone. So to me, that's just how the system is. Um, I think it's, it's a bit faulty um, and especially with something like this overlay zone. But that being as it may, the overlay zone is in place um, and I'm not taking issue with that at all. Hopefully it all works out. My really simple question is either to the municipal officials or the applicant is regarding the affordable units and parking. Is there a minimum number of spaces assigned to the affordable component? And if so, what's that number? Um, Mr. Letizia, who is the right person to answer that question? Is that for Mr. Albert or for- I, I can answer that, Madam Robert. Chairman. Okay. Um, none of the spaces are assigned at all. Um, living in this community will entitle you to park, but there are no spaces that are assigned to any of the apartments, whether they be affordable or market rate. And I, I really wasn't meaning to ask that aspect. Just in general, will the affordable component, which consists of nine units, get a you know pro rata share basically of parking spaces? They will. They or, will be. They will be or entitled. Did the, or did the overlay zone not address that? Yeah, I, in my. I do not. I do not believe that the zone addresses that issue in at all specifically. But as far as we're concerned, the affordable people who are occupy those affordable apartments have every entitlement to park in those in in our parking area, just like the just like the market rate does. Okay, that's that's all good, um, and I hope this all works with the walkable. Um, Obviously, if you do have any over solicitation for parking spaces, the people that could least afford to find alternative parking um, in that instance would be the affordables, um, the tenants. And I think that's something that at least, and, you know, a minimum should have been set aside in the overlay for the affordable components because if they get left to demand and there's over yeah go ahead david yeah i just you know i want to make the point that at least what we've always been told is that um the uh Well, so it leads to another question, which Mr. Albert should um, address, which is whether there will be a fee for the parking spaces in the garage, right? Because what I was going to say is that under New Jersey, you know, affordable housing law, uh, the residents of affordable units are not exempt, you know, from any fee that is charged to the other residents of, a, of an inclusionary development. So if there are fees um, for these parking spaces, it'd be interesting to you know, know what they are. Uh, we can't condition, put a condition on the application that the affordable units be charged less um, than the market rate units for those spaces. But I also think that it's a great question that Mr. Floyd is raising in terms of if there's oversubscription for the parking spaces that you have, you know, how you make allocations. Is it first come, first serve or what? The, the intention right now is that it's be first come, first serve. And we have not determined yet about whether or not there'd be fees for parking. Okay. Can I assume there would be a limit of no more than one space per dwelling unit? Or that's that. That's generally yeah. what is used, um, but again, we we haven't confronted that. But yes, that's generally the the, the principle. Okay. Sure. I Have think, you... and this will be my last comment. I, um, 
maybe in, in the Fair Housing Act, there is something regarding any amenities that go to market tenants also go to the affordable. And I understand the ordinance overlay, um, but I'm just asking if you run out of spots, they not be excluded from spots. And I, I suggest you give a minimum allocation at least, whether that's 20% of the total number of units or what. Or what. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I, I'm sure that this will come up again. Yeah, yeah, understood. Um, because obviously one of the very appealing <laughs> qualities of this um, project is access is walkability, of course, and bikeability and access to public transit. Um, and so, you know, very the hope very much is that you know many of the residents won't need cars. Um, and uh, but it's when it, when it's a purely first come first serve, there is no way to guarantee that on any given day, everyone who occupies an affordable unit is going to find a spot uh, on, in the garage. So um, so it is something that we'll need to noodle through um, going forward. I'm not sure that um, we can completely solve that problem tonight for this project, but Mr. Floyd? Yeah, just one quick comment. Also consider that even though it's only nine units, um, which are, are valuable units, um, uh, the affordable set aside, 80% um, in the nine units are gonna be two and, two and three bedroom units, which will probably raise the likelihood of some of them, all of them having cars. I don't know what it would be at all, but something for you folks to consider. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to announce that we currently have uh, 25 panelists, 14 attendees. I just moved over Anu Ramaswamy and we have one more person with his hand up. That's Kevin McCarthy. So okay. Mr. Ramaswamy, if you could, oh, thank you. Ms. 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 Ramaswamy. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I would, since, since I did not make this distinction with, um, with Mr. Floyd, um, I'll ask you, uh, Ms. Ramaswamy, if you have questions um, for any of the witnesses, you can maybe pose those first, um, and then we'll start the clock with, for the three minutes for your comments. Um, because we, we, I don't want to, I don't want to take up your three minutes of comment time uh, if you're, if you want to begin with posing questions. So sure. there is a distinction to be made there. And Mr. Muller needs to swear you in first. If you could raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth? Yes. So sworn or affirm, could you please state your full name and spell your last name? Anu Ramaswamy. R A M A S W A M I. Thank you. Great. So, thank you for the opportunity. And I would have joined last week. I'm actually still recovering from some sort of a flu. Um, and so, I'll just be brief. I live on 14 Charlton Street, which is right across where all those cars are coming out. Um, and so, my question, because I have not had time to review the Zoom, was both on the amount of traffic that's going to come vertically into Charlton Street from this new development. Um, right now, uh, it is very true that the lights are exceptionally bright. Uh, I, you know, they shine both into my living room, bedroom, and bathroom. Um, and then the second is more a general question of how much the traffic is expected to increase uh, and an observation that uh, there's a lot of delivery problems. Uh, even when I moved, I moved here from the University of Minnesota to Princeton two years back, and it's, it's very difficult to have moving trucks in, in that street. Um, so uh, these were my questions. I apologize uh, 
I, I would have looked at the entire Zoom. I just haven't been well enough to do it since last week. And I also want to say I really support affordable housing and, uh, you know, so I'm just trying to figure out how to not be disproportionately impacted. Thank you. Um, Mr. Letizia, I've forgotten which of your experts is the traffic guy. <laughs> well, uh, John, is, he, is he here tonight? <laughs> John McCormick is now Nick Federici, <laughs> but they're from the same firm. Uh, okay. And, uh, so Mr. Uh, Verderisi will have to be uh, sworn. Oh, he obviously was in sworn here. in and um, and credentialed. And then Mr. Verderisi, if you could quickly review the traffic projections for Charlton, and um, I think that the general testimony last week was that they had. Well, maybe Mr. Albert or Mr. Letizia can speak to the delivery, the question of deliveries and move-ins, but. Go ahead, Mr. Muller. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give it be the truth? I do. So sworn or affirm, <coughs> excuse me, or affirm, please say your full name and spell your last name. Nicholas Verderese, V-E-R-D-E-R-E-S-E. -E. Uh, Mr. Verderese, uh, briefly, can you provide your educational professional credentials, please? Yes, I've appeared before this board a number of times in the past. Um, I'm a licensed professional engineer in the state of New Jersey, principal at Dynamic Traffic. I have a Bachelor of Science degree in Civil Engineering from Rutgers University. We accept your qualifications. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, did you hear the question? Was... I did. Okay. Yes, uh, so the, the egress, the driveway that we're uh, discussing on the Charlton, uh, we project in the morning peak hour. So in a whole hour, four cars to exit that driveway in the morning. So that's essentially one car every 15 minutes. Um, and in the evening, uh, that number is uh, seven vehicles. So it's one every about almost 10 minutes. So it's a very low volume. Again, there was a driveway there. It, was, it well, had a small volume there. There are other driveways. There was a commercial, you know, there's an office component uh, that's being demolished. Uh, we're improving all the access. I'm not gonna go into all of that, but just volumes in general, very low generator. You know, there's 40 something units. They're mid-rise units. They're not high generators. It's in, you know, in the downtown. Uh, so we don't anticipate a lot of traffic from this project. Mr. Verderese, is part of the reason for that low number of folks driving out onto Charlton because you expect at least half of the folks departing the site to, to go out the driveway to Nassau Street, which um, Ms. Ramaswamy is being changed from two-way to one-way out. So the, the driveway from this site to Nassau Street is now one-way uh, egress, not uh, not ingress and egress, but is that part of what accounts for only four vehicles an hour in the morning or? That's part of it. Yeah, we, we project about two thirds of our egress traffic to go out to Nassau and about one third to Charlton. Okay. You're limited on Charlton. If you exit onto Charlton, you can only go in one direction to the south. When you get out onto Nassau, you have the option to go both uh, east and west there. So there's, there's more opportunity in that direction. And again, that's gonna be a one way. So it'll be more um, attractive uh, as opposed to when it was a two way and you had to fight someone coming in and you were going out in a 12 foot wide driveway. So uh, that's why we you know, changed all the driveways to one way because there are one way widths. So could I ask a really quick question? Yes. So are we assuming that 45 houses just generate one trip each day? No, no, those are peak hour volumes. So that's not a 24 hour daily volume. That's, so what we look at is the, the most important hours are, are when the volumes are highest on the adjacent roadways. And that's during the morning commuter peak hour, afternoon commuter peak hour. So everything we do is compressed to a 60 minute period. It's essentially the most conservative hour of the day. So that's when we do all of our analysis. What about, what about gross, what about daily volumes? So daily volumes, typically you would have, 
uh, for this type of unit, five to six trips per unit. So you're looking at maybe 200 to 225 in a 24 hour period. So if you, you know, if it was evenly spread, it would be, you know, 10 per hour. And, but what's the daily total right now? I just want to know what the relative increase in total daily. Yeah, the, the, you know, the daily, we, we didn't look specifically at the daily now. Um, we, we only had what the, you know, we did some counts of peak hour. We didn't count the daily of the existing runways. Um, but, you know, there's office buildings back there and it had trip generation. While it was lower than this, this use, it, it's still way below any thresholds of being, you know, what we consider significant, which is 100 new trips. We're only looking at 20 trips in the, right. in the highest hour. Agreed, but for people on the street, we're looking at relative changes. And so you know, there's yeah, so noise in, in addition to traffic. And so you're looking at, I would, I would personally look at a whole day uh, when I'm thinking, what is the change when we look at it being a walkable street for us? Yeah, when, when, you're, when you're looking at the whole day, um, I don't really care about midnight and how much cars come and go because there's no activity going on. So we are, we're not looking at any of those off hours. We look at the peak hours. That's the industry standard, looking at peak hours and impacts. Um, we wouldn't look at a daily. That, that doesn't really tell us much. Um, but yeah, there, there's you know 45 residential units. It generates a little bit more traffic than what was there previously. Um, but it, it's not like it's, it's, there used to be a grass parking lot, you know, a grass lot, and we're putting all new traffic. It had a 30 something space parking lot in it that people came and went, you know, commercial businesses all day long throughout the day, where residential uses generally have people leaving in the morning, coming back in the afternoon. So it's, uh, it, it's not as active, you know, consistently throughout the day like commercial uses are. Hmm. If that answers your question, hopefully. Well, I think it's just ever since I've been here, it's been the pandemic. I haven't seen much traffic at all. But That's good. That, that major, <laughs> well, no, the delta is going to be very high. You know. Yeah, I mean, there's tra so if you look out on on Nassau Street, you're looking at uh, six or seven hundred vehicles passing in an hour, and we're putting out onto there, you know, ten to twelve more. So the relative, as you mentioned earlier, relative difference, the site generates, you know, a couple percent of the total traffic on the surrounding roadways. Right. I agree on NASA. It'll be a relative small difference. I'm, I'm not fully sure, and I'll, 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 I'll do some traffic counts. Uh, I'm not fully sure that it's going to be trivial on Charlton. But my main concern well, personally is, is on the light that are going to come because I'm literally right across where that egress is. And the suggestion I made through email, I didn't know that I would have a chance to speak. So I actually have been sending a flurry of emails. Was is it possible to just come in on Charlton and leave on NASA so you don't have to come out on Charlton because mm -hmm. that is extremely bright. And right now I only have it happen twice a day uh, at night time. Well, I don't mean to throw cold water, but I don't think that at this point um, the the board is interested in considering a completely different traffic circulation. Right now, there's two two opportunities for leaving the site. The one that will be used most uh, is the one out to Nassau Street, um, and that but but Charlton is another is another choice um and um i hope that it doesn't have you know a terribly detrimental impact um on your quality of life i think the testimony has been that it will not be um, uh it's very unlikely to be real noticeable but you at least have the analysis from the traffic study. And that's sort of the best that we can give you right now, other than a, a little bit more information about deliveries, which you all also <coughs> asked. Could I, could I ask a question? Sure. Just about the headlight where maybe Jeff can, can respond. Um, obviously it's, it's a concern. Um, any thoughts about that? I know in some towns and 
maybe even in Princeton we've done this, we've actually required plantings on the side where the glare would be hitting the house to block the, uh, the headlights. Um, obviously can't be done on the um, property, the side of the property in question. Um, well, a couple, I just wanna make a couple of points. One is the, the egress leaving the site on Charlton for residential use um, happens during the morning. It does not happen in, in the evening generally uh, because people are working during the day and they're, if they're leaving during the day and they're coming out either Nassau or Charlton and coming back in the evening. So we would expect headlights actually to be, to have less impact than they, are, than they do now because now they're business uses. And the business uses now, uh, someone is in their office all day, and then they leave the site from Char on Charlton, and that's when the light would hit, you know, hit your house. So we actually expect probably that's going to lessen overall, given the change in use. Um, I don't know what we could do in terms of planting. I, honestly, we've not looked at that particular geometry to see whether or not that, you know, that that could be effective. Okay. Thank you. Can you address, or can one of your um, folks address the question related to deliveries? Well, I think we demonstrated that the, that a, a standard delivery truck actually can navigate our site, come in Charlton, come out Charlton. Um, so deliveries that are now constrained um, to stay on Charlton Street uh, in order to make you know make their deliveries. Many of those, maybe most of them, will actually come into the site and then out. Um, larger trucks uh, will will have to stay on Nassau, um, primarily Nassau Street, honestly. In fact, just the other day, I saw a FedEx truck, not a fan, but a FedEx truck, stop in front of the driveway on Nassau Street and stay there, deliver their package, inside the site and then take off from there. Um, that probably will continue to happen to some extent, but at least standard delivery um, delivery vehicles will be able to navigate our site inside. Okay. And the and the move-ins you you uh well I, I described scheduling move-ins and whatnot. Exactly. Uh, due to the fact that there's a single elevator um, and the site is has um, has constraints, uh, those will be rigidly scheduled. Um, a parking space would generally be um, be reserved for a parking vehicle. We would we would restrict uh, move-ins to vans only. Uh, and um, I think that it was testified that there are some spaces on Charlton Street that are adjacent to the parking spots now that could possibly um, also um, uh, accommodate moving vehicles, but we expect most of them uh, to be accommodated on our site proper. Okay. Ms. Ramaswamy? Yeah, so thank you for, for uh, su such detailed responses. I just had a couple of other questions, or just, uh, just responses, not questions. Um, one is I just wanna come back to the to the lights because I do get it right now and it's it's not just that it matters at night I, I there's a 4 a.m someone I think leaves to work at 4 30 and I I know that people leave to work the lights shine but that's only one at 4 30 in the morning you know the whole bedroom lights up but just thinking that this would happen multiple times at night you know in the morning uh 4.30 is still pretty dark. In the winter, 7, 8, 7 p.m. is dark. I just want to say it's an impact. We could say it's small or big, but it, it is an impact that I worry about because I know the one person who leaves. I, every morning I know when it happens because they leave and I see it. So if I were to have it multiple times, and I didn't know if they could be, we don't have to solve it today, but maybe there are ways of addressing it. I would appreciate it if we just thought about it. And I personally would love to get what that daily count is as an increase, because at least for the past two years, there hasn't been much happening behind over there. And I think the Delta traffic on the street 
maybe higher than we think if we only look at one hour in the morning and all the assumptions that go behind it. Well, thank you. Thanks. Um, so you're aware I have already moved Mr. McCarthy over. I don't okay. know if we can, if Mr. Nagari will be speaking again, he's already testified. Uh, well, he had, he had a question that he posed. He, he explicitly reserved his three minutes of comments for later. So okay. Mr. McCarthy bring him over. Did. Mr. Mr. McCarthy oh, did. Oh, I'm so Bird. sorry. I'm sorry. You're right. <laughs> I apologize. Um, sorry, Carrie. You're absolutely That's right. Um, so, G, I don't know if you want to take a five minute break at this point and, and then continue, or should we just let Mr. McCarthy say his piece? I think we should let Mr. McCarthy say his piece and um, and then we can take a break while Mr. Mueller is pulling together conditions, et cetera. And um, if that's everybody's pleasure. Mr. McCarthy. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm the owner of the office building at number six and eight Charlton Street. Uh, members of my family have lived on Charlton Street for well over a century. Uh, and I want to say that there's a lot that I like about the uh, overall project here. I like maintaining the existing street facing buildings, uh, except for tearing down the, the porch at number 13 Charlton Street, which doesn't strike me as being necessary. Uh, but, but I like seeing the more residential use downtown. Um, I like the conversion of uh, underutilized commercial use to residential use, uh, and I fully understand the affordable housing uh, component. But I do have two issues with the development uh, as proposed. Uh, one is the shifting of vehicle traffic to Charlton Street, and the other is the height uh, of the building. The driveway at number six and eight, I'm sorry, at number uh, nine and 11, Charlton has been designated as the only ingress for the site. Uh, because the Nassau Street driveway is egress only. Uh, it doesn't seem appropriate to take all of the incoming traffic away from a commercial state highway, uh, Nassau Street Route 27, and transfer it to a narrow, one-way, largely residential side street. Uh, every uh, resident of the complex, every commercial tenant, uh, every visitor, every delivery, every moving van, every Uber, every construction vehicle will have to drive in on Charlton Street only. The impact on Charlton Street will be significant. Uh, the study shows that the uh, morning uh, rush hour and evening rush hour uh, ingress number rising from, if I count it correctly, uh, one to uh, 24 uh, vehicles. And the egress at uh, 13 Charlton Street, as we've just heard, uh, would also uh, increase uh, significantly. <clears throat> the Nassau Street driveway has always been used for ingress and egress. Uh, I think it should continue to do so and perhaps be used in addition to the two Charlton Street driveways. Uh, my other point is um, about the height of the building. It's probably unavoidable that the building will be out of character with the neighborhood. It's surrounded by buildings mostly from the 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, the zoning ordinance uh, of 50 feet is generous uh, and I believe sufficient to encourage this sort of development, especially since the proposed roof uh, will add another 10 feet or so of mechanicals and the uh, uh, and the uh, 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 sitting area and the walking area. Uh, the, the project would be at 50 feet uh, or close to it uh, simply by reducing the uh, unit ceiling height from nine feet to eight feet, which used to be the common industry standard. The building will loom over the neighborhood. We saw that in uh, Mr. Barton's renderings last week, uh, but it would loom about 10% less uh, if it stays within that 50 feet. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Mr. McCarthy. Um, any uh, response or any further questions from Board members, I, I think that the, um, well, I think you, you were at last week's meeting, so you heard the applicant's testimony about the ceiling height. Um, and the driveway to, you know, between this site and Nassau Street is, is really narrow enough that the that it's just an unsafe condition for it to be uh, two-way. 
uh, even though it's been that way for some time, but with additional dwellings and with, um, uh, you know, the, the need to simplify the traffic movements on Nassau Street and make it safer for pedestrians, both on the side, Nassau sidewalk and for uh, um, folks who might, I, don't, I can't remember whether there's a sidewalk along this driveway out to Nassau, but I, th I think the board, although I invite discussion of this if folks want to, but I think the board was satisfied that the one-way egress onto Nassau was a, on balance an improvement the existing condition. Um, and, and, you know, the whole point of having 38 parking spots with a residential structure that has what is it, 45 <laughs> dwellings is, is to make it clear to folks that this is a place where you can move without a car. And so I, um, I expect that there's going to be more of that in the downtown area as well. Um, okay, so I, um, at Carrie's suggestion, uh, I do think it's a good time to, to take a break, uh, unless folks want to, well, let's take a break and then we can come back and have any kind of final discussion that we have and a motion and then go through, um, uh, conditions, et cetera. Does that sound good? Very good. Thank you. Okay, so it's uh, 923. I'll see everybody back at 930. Back up. Thank you. Uh, I neglected before we broke to formally close the public portion of the hearing, so I'll do that right now. Um, are there uh, questions, comments, um, things folks want to discuss? Mr. Cohen? Um, just a couple things. I. I want to um, acknowledge in particular Mr. McCarthy's comments, uh, you know, about rerouting the incoming traffic on Carrollton wow. Street. I agree with the chair that the current condition with that 12 foot wide driveway is not a safe one. But I I feel like the, uh, the applicant's traffic consultant did a little bit of a disservice by not quantitatively addressing the levels of traffic from the current office use, including that portion of the office use, which will remain because the, you know, we know that the front buildings fronting on Nassau Street will continue to operate in that way. Um, so without letting it rise to the level of um, letting it impede, you know, the the application going forward. I just want to acknowledge um, Mr. McCarthy's, the you know, the validity of his comments and to ask, you know, the traffic consultant um, to do better in that regard in, in the future, because I know we'll see them again. Um, I think um, I also want to acknowledge, um, I, I forget her name, but the, uh, other, Ramaswamy? Yeah, Ms. Ramaswamy's um, point that there's going to be a significant delta between the traffic that's on Charlton now and what will be after this development, but make the point that we really need to be, as a board, considering, um, you know, the pre-pandemic traffic, the, the fact that this um, site was generating a certain amount of traffic before um, before the shutdown, and that that's really what the board should be comparing to. And I think that I am convinced um, that the the levels of uh, traffic in and out of this parking lot, well, especially out of this traffic out of this parking lot at hours when the headlights will be at issue. The, the change is going to be minimal from what a pre-pandemic condition would have been. That doesn't mean that she's not going to experience a significant uptick, but that's not the, I don't think that's the purview of this board 
to be comparing uh, or trying to <laughs> trying to uh, preserve a pandemic level of traffic in Denver, <laughs> and that's not that shouldn't be our goal. Um, I have one minor uh, suggestion in terms of the, the maneuvering inside the parking garage, which is if we do go ahead and move that entry a few feet to the south, uh, as was discussed earlier, that will also allow potentially the, the whole row of parking spaces to shift, which will allow a little bit more of a turnaround for the northernmost parking spot on the east side of the garage. And I know that that was a concern. And so I just wanted to make that point that um, the, all of those spaces should be shifted. It's a minor improvement, but I think it's an improvement for that one parking space to be mm -hmm. able to have a little bit of a turnaround space. Um, doesn't imply any change to the, uh, to the floor plan. It's just a striping thing, I think. Um, and then, you know, other than that, I think um, I really like the application. I think it's really uh, has embraced the intent of the AHO one overlay, and um, it's going to bring a lot of uh, dynamism uh, with the new residential units to uh, to our downtown. Thanks, Mr. Cohen, Mr. Quinn. Thank you. I would echo. Um... Councilman Cohen's uh, comments about this project. I'm a supporter of infill development, and I think that um, we do a good job here, that uh, the applicant's done a good job here, uh, given the constraints of the site. Um, it conforms with the zoning that was put in place by our elected officials, and um, the ordinances were reviewed by this board for compliance with the master plan and found to be in compliance with the goals and objectives of the master plan. I will say that Mr. Mr. Floyd's comments um, uh, definitely give me pause. Um, I know that part of the zoning, uh, the thinking was that uh, people would live here uh, we would be encouraging people to live here without a car, which is a, of course, a, a noble goal and one that I, I hope to live car free in retirement. Um, however, and I know that there, that the applicant cited um, some market study about the, the parking being supported by a trend in the market. Um, that said, I, I, I heard Mr. Floyd loud and clear. We all know, uh, especially those of us who took the time to read the 2017 Nelson Nygaard um, comprehensive parking study, that there's a vast secondary market for parking um, that people who do not um, uh, get parking with their rental unit um, are then forced to go into the secondary market and rent parking spaces. Uh, and it is a concern because the people in the affordable units would be least likely to participate in this. Um, again, it's not for this board to decide. Um, uh, the question of reserving spaces, um, but if it's a first come first serve parking, um, there's I, there's nothing stopping as someone renting who has two vehicles from parking those two vehicles in one of the in two of the thirty eight parking spaces and leaving them there while they walk and bike around town. So right. I, I'd like to see there's, I, again, it's not this board's concern. This fully conforms with the zoning and uh, it's not, uh, I don't see a, a, a lot to quibble with here other than 
everything re everything revolves around parking. Uh, I'm convinced that everything in the universe resolve, revolves around parking in one way or another. There's uh, six degrees of parking um, if you raise any kind of subject. So I, I'd like to see, um, I, I actually had a question for Jerry at the end of this speech. Um, would we be able to put a condition on any application uh, requiring uh, parking spaces be reserved for uh, for affordable units? Obviously, it's not in the ordinance. I'm guessing the answer is no, but I feel compelled based on what I heard from Mr. Floyd to ask the question at least. Yeah, I think we can. Oh, well, I, I don't know how my colleagues on the board feel about that as a condition, but I would, I would strongly support that because I, I do think the situation, if, if it's first come first served and I'm not served, then I'm parking elsewhere. I'm parking someplace, to my knowledge, most of the of the parking in town, uh, overnight parking ban is still in effect. So it's not as if I could drive my car to Jugtown and park on the street all day and night. Um, anyway, I, I think I've been heard on this. I don't want my comments to be seen as uh, lacking enthusiasm for, for this application. I intend to vote yes. It can it conforms with the uh, with the zoning and it achieves um, many of the goals of the master plan. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Tim. Um, Mr. O'Donnell and then Mr. Cohen. Thank you. Um, I just want to add my two cents on parking. Also, I just uh, don't understand if you have a, a facility with thirty eight parking spots. With I'm sorry, uh, forty five apartments plus plus businesses. And are only providing 38 parking spots. Uh, Mr. Albert said that they had not determined whether they were going to charge for parking. I don't see how you can. I mean, I don't think the board has any uh, say over that at all, but it's just my personal opinion that if you're not at least providing one parking spot for each residence, then I don't see how you can charge for parking. That's all I have to say. Yeah, that, that would reduce the rent levels, by the way, for the affordable units. If there were fees like that charged for the affordable housing uh, units, yeah, Mr. Cohen. Well, okay. So, um, first of all, I, I think part of um, my confusion, and I think probably other people's confusion right now, is just trying to understand exactly what the applicant means when they say first come, first serve. My assumption is not that anybody can come and park in this parking lot um, without any controls whatsoever. Rather, it is that individual spaces are not reserved for a specific resident or, and I see Jeff nodding, so. Yeah, may, may I answer? I, yeah. I don't know whether it's appropriate, yes. but. So not unlike the municipal garage, when you, when you, purchase a monthly pass, it entitles you to park in that lot. It does not give you a particular space. And I know as a, as a owner of a monthly pass, I have been rejected from the lot several times. Mm -hmm. um, and that may be the case here. So it, there'll be a tag or some other kind of way to designate the fact that you were entitled to park there, but you do not have a designated individual reserved space. Um, and other, other parking arrangements work that way. Uh, is it imperfect? Yes, but, it, but it, 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 it can function. And reserving, you know, reserving some spaces for some and not for others is administratively very, very difficult. We do not want to be in the position of policing, you know, parking lots on a constant basis. Um, so, so that, that's, that's what we intend. Okay. Jeff, how, how do you, yeah. 
How do you enforce um, the idea that you just articulated that there's going to be something that shows that people have a, a, are entitled to park there? Well, um, the, the university does this constantly with stickers on their bumpers. And for those people that were that are parking there in, inappropriately, they can be they can be uh, they can be um, uh, tagged. They can be uh, they can be hauled out. Um, you know, they're privately, of course, um, unless we want to uh, entertain a you know Title Thirty Nine. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't think it's for the municipality to police our parking lot. It's up to us. Um, but there'll be some some indication on a vehicle that will demonstrate that it is appropriate, you know, it's appropriately parking there. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that that uh, that, account, that that indication is not there, then they'll be dealt with. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, I, and then I want to follow up. Uh, I think I better understand Owen's comment, where he's saying, you know, he thinks that you can't charge for them if you have a shortage you know, of spaces. And I think, Owen, confirm if I'm right, what you're saying is that if you're giving out 45 stickers to residents plus 20 stickers to office users, and you've only got 38 spaces, how can you charge for those stickers? Because you can't, you're not guaranteeing people a spot. Um, you know, what I would like to suggest, and again, I'm not suggesting this is a condition of approval, but I think that I understand the applicant to be saying that, you know, the office parking and the residential parking in principle is shared because it is complementary, that the residential spaces are mostly needed at night and the office spaces are mostly needed during the day. And so you can give out more stickers then you actually have parking spaces and it can work. But what I do think the applicant might want to consider is giving out daytime stickers, you know, for the offices. So, and 24 hour stickers for the residents so that, uh, you know, office people are not taking up those residential spaces at night when the residents really need them. Um, so, well, it's just, it, it, I can address that um, in, in so, uh, I mean, our, our thinking on that is that a commercial uh, user who would again have an identification of some sort would not be permitted to park there um, on in non-business hours. I mean, you know, flexibly that's, eight, that's, eight to six, something like that. That's what I was suggesting, yeah. Yeah, Good. that's exactly right. Okay. Good, thank you. Other other board members with questions or comments? The, the concern that I have about the notion of setting aside spaces for us in addition to the, well, setting aside spaces for a subset of tenants is that when they're gone, if they have, um, you know, jobs, long, that they need to drive to and long hours and whatnot, then then their assigned spot yeah. uh, is not usable by others that uh, you know who have a different work schedule or uh, or whatever. And and so it just sort of the the idea of shared parking sort of goes out the window. Um, but it is a it, I, I too really. Um, recognize, acknowledge Mr. Floyd's points and it's not an easy thing to noodle through. Um, Mr. Cohen. Again, just for clarification. So with the resident, uh, with the residential units, would you envision, uh, Jeff, giving out more stickers to residents than you have parking spaces? Um, available on the site. We may, because again, it, you know, it, it, the fact that you can't find a spot at that particular time doesn't mean that there are other times that you would be 
precluded from parking there. Okay. If we were only if we were only giving out thirty eight stickers, we might as well designate them, uh, even though there are all kinds of issues with that, which I don't want to get into. Um, it, we found that the, the the fairest way, and although this sounds odd, but the fairest way is to give everyone an equal opportunity for the spaces um, and to have schedules sorted out uh, and not to, you know, not to designate or, or pre-prescribe where all of those, you know, where all the parking is going to be. Yeah. But if you're renting an apartment, um, you should be entitled to at least the opportunity of parking there. Mr. Quinn? Yeah, thanks. I, I just wanted to clarify. I was not suggesting the reservation as a as a condition. I just mm -hmm, wanted to mm -hmm. continue the dialogue and get the legal opinion. I again it's I, I think imperfect is the is the watchword here. Um, and as fair as possible in the spirit of um, economic diversity, that might not be possible. Um, but it's still there's, there's something about it that's unsettling, but might not be fixable. So I just wanted to be clear that I was not suggesting it as a condition. The only thing that I suggested as a condition was a letter from the, mm -hmm. the, the fire, the fire department about access to and from the site. Uh, that was my only my only condition. And I know that parking discussions can go on um, all night. So um, I just wanted to, to be clear about that I wasn't making it a condition. I just wanted to hear from my colleagues about this. Yeah. Thank you. And you're you're absolutely right about parking discussions. I I keep it coming back in my mind to the, you know, telling myself it's it, it's our job over time <laughs> to make to help make Princeton the kind of place where you just don't need a car. And we can't we just can't be making so many decisions based on the accommodating as many cars as possible. So anyway, um, uh, other any other final thoughts or comments? And if I'm not seeing any hands go up. Would someone like to make a motion? And what the motion would be would be a preliminary and final site plan approval, the granting of the two variances for the height and the setback intrusion, um, the de minimis exception from RSIS for the amount of, of parking, and whatever conditions the board chooses to impose if the board chooses to approve this project. And one other waiver, uh, Jerry. Is the oh audit. yes, right. The the the, the drive aisle width right. of twenty two spaces or uh, twenty two feet. Well, twenty four feet is required. Right. Thanks to me. I'll move it. Moved by Mr. Cohen, seconded by. Jump at once. I'll second. Thank you, Mr. O'Donnell. Um, so, Mr. Muller, would you go over conditions, please? Yep. <clears throat> First, I'm gonna go through my notes. Then I'm gonna go through the report from, from Dan Weissman and Derek. And then I'm gonna go through, hopefully very quickly, a, um, a lengthy letter that uh, uh, Tom Matici had, had submitted in terms of responses to all the, uh, the comments in the professional in the professional's reports. Okay. Um, site so make sure to do the, I'm sorry to, I no. don't mean to upset your rhythm or whatever, but just make sure it makes sense to do the, the letter for Mr. Letizia first so that we can just identify those sticking points if there are any. I don't think so because I think a lot of the- Okay, all right. Actually, you do like your the, thing. I like you the rhythm. I like the rhythm, that, I like that. Okay. <laughs> Uh, 
This, uh, the site lighting would be changed to a warmer spectrum, um, change in materials for the two parallel parking spaces um, in the exit from, I guess, the, where is it? The exit from, to, to Charlton? No, to no, Charlton. from uh, to Charlton, correct. The exit, the egress. Yeah, yeah the exactly. egress. Yes. Right. Um, the, the chair had raised the question of, of cisterns rather than rain barrels. Is that okay with the applicant having a reaction? No. Well, I, we, we are we are actually researching that. I mean, I, th I, I think okay. if, if we can say that we're, you know, we're actively looking at it and it's our intention to do so, that's fine. We just haven't settled on a particular one at this point. And so. that's fine. I, I did not mean for it to be a hard and fast condition, but rather a suggestion, which I thought might be a better option than rain barrels. Yeah, I mean, I, th I, I think that's right. Yeah. Okay. Um, Hold on. And then that whole th the whole thing we've talked about with parking and stickers, I mean, I don't think that's something we want to get into. Uh, at least I haven't heard anything on that. Anybody on the board feel to the contrary? No. Okay. Emergency services must be satisfied. Um, and the, the form of documentation, I'll just you know, elaborate a little in the, in the resolution. In terms of the fencing and and uh, curbing for um, to demarcate the university property and the property in question, we've gone over that. Uh, the areas that will be fenced and and, de and and curb, we've discussed at some length. I don't think we need to go over that right now. Um, Want to put in a um, a condition that says uh, that the university can. Um, or its successor in interest can, can fence in the entire lot, its entire lot. Um, the sidewalk um, on the east side, I guess it's the east side of the garage, um, would be moved um, to the south three or four feet. It's the north side, is that right? Or was oh, so it the north side? Chief Jeffrey, what's the correct? It, it's the south side. I'm sorry, it's the south side, yeah. Okay. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, the two southern spaces in the garage will be compact spaces. The landscaping plan will go to the landscape committee. Um, in terms of assigning spaces to the affordable units, I didn't, uh, obviously, Tim just raised that as a thought. He wasn't proposing that. Is there anybody who wants to pursue that? Okay. Well, it, it sounds like from what Mr. Albert said that every unit will be entitled to get a, at least a sticker. So yeah, correct. In, in that way, I think that's getting to what Tim was mm -hmm. looking we're not get in, we're That's not correct. Gonna get, we're not going to get into that. No. Um, Dan, Dan and Derek, just on your memo, um, page six of eight, under M, advertising features, the applicant shall submit details of the backlit signs for review to ensure compliance with Princeton code. That should be in? Uh, yes, sir. And uh, while we're on the subject, we'd also like to see a detail of the architectural feature that will serve as a screen around the parking garage element of the building. Agreed. Hold on. Thank you. Bear with me. Okay, and then um, the consolidation of the three lots. The applicant shall, this is another, this is from page, also from page six of uh, Dan and Derek's uh, memo. The applicant shall supply hydrant flow test results from New Jersey water, American water to determine if they comply with municipal standards. That should go in? Yep. Yep. 
construction cost estimate, not which we normally do. Um, possible approvals from uh, higher level jurisdictions. Let me see. Affordable housing agreement, it'll actually be a restriction. Um, and it says the applicant shall supply, but uh, my office will prepare that. Photometric, uh, and this is now 6.5 photometric site plan should be revised to ensure light trespass meets the requirements of 10B 317.1. I assume that goes in. Yes. Yep. Okay. Applicant should provide a lighting plan for the below grade parking garage. Mm -hmm. to the requirements of 317.1D3. That goes in. Yep. Yep. Okay. The applicant shall reconstruct the driveway and sidewalk on Nassau Street, which will be disturbed by the installation of the underground water main. That goes in, I assume. Yeah. Okay. Sewer connection fee shall be computed and uh, paid prior to the issuance of building permits at the then current connection fee rate. That has a history behind it uh, relating to another application, but I won't get into that. Um, and the, the applicant shall comply with the requirements of the traffic consultant report. I'm not even sure there were actually any. Um, Dave, Dave, were there any in your report? I didn't see any. Any, uh, sorry, I, I that cut out for me for a moment. Were there any uh, proposed recommend uh, proposed conditions in your report? Uh, not conditions. We do have our concerns, but uh, a lot of the testimony here is, has addressed them. So okay. as long so that, as we see those those modifications made, um, things will things will be pretty pretty square. Thank you. Okay, that, that's that's fine. Jerry, Jerry, I will mention, you know, as you went through the list of things we've discussed during the meeting, you did not touch on shifting the entry exit, <laughs> the parking garage. Oh, I thought I did. I, I, well, you talked about the sidewalk when what we're shifting, it it narrows the sidewalk, but it shifts the entrance and exit okay. three or four feet to the south. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, good. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. I didn't understand what you were referring to because of the way it was described. Yeah. No, thank you for right. clarifying that, Mr. Cohen. That's my fault. Bear with me. All right, let me try and go through as quickly as I can the, um, Tom's letter, which is quite long, but um, I don't think there's much in it that we need. Um, the applicant, uh, well, this is had been proposed by uh, one of the professionals. The applicant uh, shall place a small wayfaring uh, finding sign subject municipal staff approval at the front of the building on Nassau Street to protect to direct pedestrians to the Charlton, uh, Charlton Street sidewalk serving the new building. That's okay? Yes. Okay. Um, and then there is some dealing with uh, stuff from Dan's report, but the landscape committee will take care of all of that, um, you know, including protection of the trees. I don't know. I don't know that I need to list those individually because they're all going to the Landscape Committee, everybody agree? Yes. Okay. Yes, if you can just make sure that the Landscape Committee has all of those things, you know, on, on its radar yeah. when the time comes. I'll put them in as conditions and I think that's the best bet. Okay. Then um, the applicant should consider um, augmenting the proposed planting in the landscape buffer. They've talked about that already. Hold on.
So there's a whole bunch of them dealing with landscaping. I'm, I'm not even going to go over them because I'll put them in the uh, in the resolution as conditions just to alert the uh, landscape committee. You know some of the things that they should be looking at. Um, photometric site plan should be revised to ensure light trespass meets the requirements of um, 10B 117A 1365.1. Um, I don't think that's in, but I'll put it in. Um, I think you did mention that. Did I? Did I? Okay, yeah. Um, applicants shall provide a lighting plan for the on grade parking. I, I mentioned yes. that also. Yep. Um, Terry, what section are you in in my letter? <laughs> I'm on page four. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, well, you were, I thought we already went through the engineering and zoning report. That's where you're in now. Yeah, I, right. Okay, so I think we can probably skip over that section. Okay. Um, then under utility services, well, this is also in the, the report of the, the engineering report. Um, and the suggestion was the applicant should consider installing underground services for the existing buildings shown to remain at 911 at Charlton and 13 Charlton. And you said the applicant will take into consideration, uh, and I guess do it is, is to the extent practicable. Um, back I back. just asked, it wasn't clear to me whether that condition or that suggestion was related to concern about overhead wires interfering with firefighting equipment. And that's it's a separate issue. We see it as a separate issue. We 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 will eliminate all overhead wires that interfere with firefighting equipment. It was it was for other underground um, utility connections that we will study and make every effort. Uh, they, they are they are separate. Okay. Because because I knew know I saw that in the in the in Joe Novak's um, yes comments yeah. I'm glad to hear you'll make every effort because every little bit when it comes to getting utilities underground. Yeah, yeah, we, we agree. We should really try to do. I mean, they're just a scourge. Agreed. There, there's a, a comment in, in one of the professional reports about installing the, um, actually installing the, uh, required number of EV spaces within a certain period of time, but that's required by statute. I don't know that we need to put that in. Um, if anybody disagrees, let me know. Um, sheet four on the site plan drawings must be revised to show the dimensions of the three compact parking spaces that are proposed. And I guess, the same revision for the other two that Jeff agreed to earlier today, tonight. Um, and then uh, site plan be revised to include site triangles at the egress driveways. Are they, are they in the revised plans? To the extent that they are not, we will add them. Sure, of course. Fire lines and striping subject to approval of, well, that's part of the whole fire subcode official. Um, but I'll put that in that uh, fire lanes and striping is subject to the approval of the fire subcode official. Traffic signs and striping shall follow the requirements of the manual on uniform traffic control devices. Um, the bunch on the representation, then, in fact, that emergency services has approved this, but we're going to make sure we get something uh, from the um, of emergency services in indicating that's the case and to the extent it's not what they have to do to, to make it happen. Um, From then, the fire marshal, you mean? Yes, right, right. Uh, the, uh, the plans will be revised to include a proposed fire hydrant within 50 to 100 feet of the FDC as required. Can I think?
Um, there's something in here about mini split HVA systems, but that's part of, of your plans, uh, Jeff, at this point, right? That's yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I don't think I don't, I don't think that was intended to be a condition. Uh, yeah, but that's what we intend to do. Yeah. yeah. And I, I don't think it needs to be. Um Then one of the proposals, uh, and I guess it's the BEC report, is the applicant shall ma make every attempt to attain a zero energy project. Yes, we agree. Okay. That okay. Then the contractor um, shall be encouraged to perform life cycle assessment for material selection, um, and the ownership will elect to use materials that reduce embodied carbon carbon as practicable. Is that all right? Yes. Jerry, I just want to correct. When we talk about a net zero energy building, there's net zero ready, That's which is a standard, a federal standard. And then there's an actual net zero, which means that you're generating all your energy on site that you need to actually be net zero. I don't think you guys yeah. have provisions for uh, renewable energy on site. So I think it's net zero ready is what you're- That's right. Uh, That's okay. right. I, and I we just want that language to be correct. And okay, good. Thank you, David. Thanks. Um, then we talked about the screening, um, living screens. That's gonna be part of the, uh, you know, we're practicable non-living screens when I, when it's, appropriate and that's going to be part of what's reviewed by the landscape subcommittee then pervious surfaces will be used where practicable jeff okay yes could i could i just ask yeah. is that is that possible in those two parking spaces that project into the buffer yeah we'll study that i mean i i think that's a fair Comment. I, I, we, we will, we will study that. Yeah, I'd like. And if to, it's practicable, we'll, we will do it. Yeah, I'd like to do that to, uh, you know, uh, be responsive to the comment from the one member of the public who was concerned about drainage in that area. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The well, I mean, we could go into the drainage issue, but okay. Let, let, let's stop. not. But no, it's not. Yeah. I, I, I know that most of it is no, landscaped, no. which is great. If we could make those uh, pervious, that would be great too. Um, um, herb gardens on the roof, is that is that something we wanna get into, require? Or I know, I think the testimony was the applicant was planning on doing that. We, 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 are, con we are considering it. What we said is that if there was Sufficient interest on behalf of the residents, we would, we would like to see that happen. I don't, I don't know that we okay. agree to that as a condition. Okay, let's not. I don't, I don't know that we need to make it one unless members of the board think so. Um, it needs to be a condition. I made the point that your residents are going to want vegetation on the roof. <laughs> okay. Um, just, just because it makes the environment so much more pleasant to you know, spend time. Um, uh, but there's a lot going on up there and and your residents you know will want shade as well and you can figure out how that'll all work okay and then talk about natural vegetation uh ventilation um but i don't think we need to make that a condition that's something we usually don't get involved in um are we talking about whether the windows open yeah do the windows open Yes. Good. <laughs> Should we make that a condition, um, Louise? It's already part of the plan. I don't. I don't okay. think that it needs to yep. be a. Then um, a preliminary air qual indoor air quality plan will be prepared following the preparation of construction documents and identification of relevant building systems. Okay. Yes, that's what we offered as a oh, okay. response to that. Yeah. 
Okay, we're going to have a different color of those for the pavers for those two spots. Um, yeah, you you actually raised that before. Mm -hmm. Oh, I did. Okay. And then there was a uh, proposal by uh, I guess it was PEC. Um, shade trees be added to the landscape design to incorporate larger scale trees that are more appropriately scaled to the height of the new building. Um, Can we not leave that to the landscape committee? Okay, so I, I won't. I will not put that in as a as a condition. Um, Keeping in mind that the landscape committee does pay attention to what the shade tree committee says, so it's a good idea to <laughs> a good be idea. mindful of that. I, I'm I'm not saying Jerry to put it in as a condition. I'm I'm directing that comment to the applicant for when they come to the. Okay, yeah. we understand. Then um, the applicant anticipates the exterior use of 27, um, 2700K LED lighting. Um, put that in. Yeah, I think I think you already mentioned that. We yeah, agreed it's a, to a warmer spectrum. Warmer yeah. spectrum, correct. Yeah. Oh, okay. The applicant will work with the utility company to identify the most ideal placement of the transformer, uh, including a real relocation if practicable. Yes. Yep. And that's it. Okay. So, um, uh, Mr. DeGrazias, I yes. see, raised his hand. I'm sorry, I just wanted to make sure. I, Jerry, I don't think you mentioned the access declaration easement in the language that Tom and I talked about. Oh, yeah, yeah, right, right. Thank you, thank you. Um, right. and that'll, that'll be as is set forth in those two emails from Christopher and Tom that thank we got you. at the end of the day and I distributed. But that'll be, that'll be a condition as well. Very good, thank you. Good. So we have a motion and a second, and we've laid out conditions. Um, are we ready to vote? I think we are. Um, Ms. Phillip, will you call for a vote, please? Ms. Capizzoli? Yes. Mr. Chow? Yes. Mr. Cohen? Yes. Mr. McGowan? Yes. Mr. O'Donnell? Yes. Mr. Quinn? Yes. Mr. Taylor? Jack? Oops. Oh, is, is he gone? No. He's still oh, there. He's here. oh, there, oh, there we there. go. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Is that three and votes? <laughs> you don't need it. And Mrs. Wilson. Yes. Motion so we carried. can have Jack's voice or we can have his face, but we can't have both. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. Well, thanks everybody. Um thank you. I just want to express how how grateful we are for the for this review and how much time you've given us. We really appreciate it and we're we plan to make the community and you all proud. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You. Albert. That's right. a, a great note to, to conclude on. That's your cue, Mr. Cohen. <laughs> to adjourn. I'll second. Thank you. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you again, Mr. Albert. Thank you to your whole team. And Thank you. um Good luck. Board members, we'll see you next week. Yes, good luck. Thank you. Good night, Cole. Good night. Good night. Uh, Madam Chair, board, thank you all very much. Have a pleasant weekend and uh, be safe, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. You too.